We're on the record. And uh, are we recording? Record. We're recording. Shoot the music. Yeah, somebody recording the WebEx. I am. I'm recording. This is Barbara. Barb, can we record? I am. Not answering. Uh, sorry, sorry, I'm. Well, somebody didn't needs get to that. Turn on oh, sorry, the, the recording on the hearing room. Eric, is that something you can do? I, I heard it say. Yeah, I don't have a story on that. Host. Eric has muted. Are you? I'm. Can you guys hear me or not? I can. Yeah, I'm recording. Can you hear me? Well, there's Barbara, can you hear us? Are we recording? I can hear Barbara. Yeah, I am recording. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. okay. right, there's, there's something can, going on. Can you hear me? I hear you, Erica. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. On the deliberation room, they can't hear you on the meeting room speakers. The question was, is someone recording this? Um, and we couldn't uh, make contact with Barbara either. I am recording. Barbara has been, she's been answering. She is recording. Okay, um, we can't hear her on our end. And she is recording? Yes. Yes, and there's a little red dot at the top of your screen on the right hand side. At least it's red on mine, okay. and it says meeting recording is. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to turn my speakers back off now. Okay, thank you. Annette, are you still can hear me okay? Yes, I can. I see you shaking your head. Okay, very good. I guess we'll get started on it. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the September 29th, 2022 meeting of the Syracuse Border in the rear. This hearing is being held via video conference call via WebEx at the following location. The Hughes State Office Building, 333. East Washington Street, first floor, room B, Syracuse, New York, 13202. Time now is 946, and this hearing is officially open. The members of the board are, to my right, Andrew Garlock, to my left, Gail Swistick, remotely, Shaheen Badali, and remotely, Andy Ellis. My name is C. Thomas Parsons. I'm chairman of this board. And from the Department of State, we have uh, Tom DiTulio and Okay, Scott Shane. Let's see. Back to me. We will now hear the scheduled petitions. When you speak, please address the board and give your name, title, and legal address so that our court reporter can have all the information requested. We may have to stop from time to time to consult with our technical staff. In making comments to the board, please provide a descriptive narrative on the matters referring to your exhibits to enable the court reporter to enter these into the record. Prior to this first hearing, I would like to ask all present in this hearing for a moment of silence for a member of the board um, who passed away in August, Michael Robb. Michael was a long-term member of this board and um, his dedication and his participation as a member of the board will be surely missed. So I ask everyone just take a moment and remember Michael, those who know him, and those who didn't, of how great a person he was and how much he contributed to this board. Thank you. Their first hearing is in the matter of petition number 2022-0446. Petitioner is Paul Richardson. This is an MRL case. Oh, 
for each member of the cloud. Do any board members have a comment regarding this MRL? Okay. Do, you? Do I have a motion regarding this petition? Which one is the MRL? What number is it? 2022-0446. It's the application of Paul Richardson, 5827 County Highway 18, West Edmiston, New York. Okay, do I have a motion? I make the motion. Ms. Swissack makes a motion. In the matter of the petition of Paul Richardson for a variance of New York State Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code, Petition number 2022-0446 upon the application of Paul Richardson 5827 County Highway 18, West Edmonston, New York, filed pursuant to 19 NYCRR 1205 of August 15, 2022, and upon all other papers in the matter, the department makes the following determination. The petition pertains to an existing apartment building with four dwelling units, two stories with an occupied attic, wood framed, type 5B combustible construction, located at 423 Lansing Street, City of Utica, County of Oneida, State of New York. Relief is requested from Chapter 61B of Consolidated Law of New York Municipal Residential Law, Article 3, Section 26, Egress from Dwellings. In every such dwelling, three stories or more in height, there shall be from each story at least two independent means of egress accessible to each apartment or suite. The first means shall open into a public hall connected with the stair affording safe access to a street or to a yard, court, or passageway affording continuous, safe, and unobstructed access to a street. The second means shall be directly to a fire escape or to an enclosed stair without passing through the first means except that where the first means includes an interior stair, which is closed off at each floor level by fire retarded construction with fireproof self-closing door therein. The second means may be another such interior stair or fire escape directly accessible on the same story from a public hall therein whether or not such public hall is also part of the first means of egress provided such fire escape is not a wire, chain, cable, vertical ladder, or rope fire escape. In lieu of a second means of egress, a sprinkler system may be installed in the public halls and stairs. The petitioner requests relief to not having to provide a second means of egress from the second floor apartment and an occupied attic space. Chapter 16B, Consolidated Law of New York, Municipal Law, Article 3, Section 28, Stairs and Entrance Halls. In every such dwelling, three stories or more in height, the wood wainscoting and other combustible materials on walls and ceiling surfaces in all halls shall be removed. In lieu of such removal, a sprinkler system may be installed, or such wainscoting and combustible surfaces may be treated or covered with the surface fire retardant approved by the department. In such a dwelling, any entrance door and every door opening into an entrance hall, stair hall, or other public hall connected therein shall be self-closing. 
the petitioner requests relief to allow wood waves coating. Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Law of New York Municipal Residential Law, Article 3, Section 30, Cellar Ceilings. Cellar ceilings in every such dwelling, three stories or more in height, the ceiling or the cellar or of the lowest story, if there is no cellar, shall be fire retardant or be equipped with sprinkler system unless such ceiling has already been plastered to the satisfaction of the department. The petitioner requests relief from the requirements for fire rating of seal cellar ceiling. Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Law of New York Municipal Residential Law, Article 3, Section 31, Inside Cellar Stairs which requires that every stair leading from a cellar to a floor above in an old multi-dwelling shall be enclosed with fire retardant partitions and shall be equipped with the fire retardant self-closing door located as the department may approve. The petitioner requests relief from the requirements for fire rating for stairs. Findings of facts. Number one, the building that is the subject of the petition is a two story wood frame multifamily residence with the third floor occupied attic. The building was constructed prior to 1910 and consists of four dwelling units. Number two, the subject building is required to conform to the provisions of Article 3 of the Municipal Residential Law as provided in Section 25, in that it exists on July 1st, 1952, or was converted to a multiple dwelling after July 1st, 1952, and is not a hotel or similar dwelling subject to Article 4 of the Municipal Law. Number three. MRL section 26 states that in every dwelling, three stories or more in height, there shall be from each story at least two independent means of egress accessible from each apartment or suite. The petitioner states that the attic apartment requires two independent means of egress. At the present, only one enclosed stair down to the exterior egress point. A second allowable means of egress, such as an additional stairway or approved fire escape ladder, is needed. Number four, New York State MRL Section 28 requires that all doors on the hallway shall have self closing hinges. Petitioner stated that the self closing hinges will be installed as directed by the fire department. Number five, New York State MRL section 30 requires the lowest story basement ceiling be fire rated or protected by a sprinkler system. However, the existing building basement ceiling is not enclosed with fire retardant material nor protected with a sprinkler. The fire in the in the cellar could easily spread throughout the building if not noticed. There is mechanical system piping and electrical wiring along the ceiling of this unoccupied cellar, which would make installing fire retardant ceiling very difficult. Number six, New York State MRL section 31 requires that the interior cellar stairs to the basement shall be enclosed with fire retardant partitions and equipped with fire retardant self-closing door located as the department approves. Number seven, the petitioner has stated that they will install smoke and carbon monoxide detectors in the basement, which shall connect to the other alarms in the common stairways and hallways so that when 
initiated the alarms will notify the residents. Number eight, the petitioner states that the first floor consists of a single apartment with two egress exits, and the second floor consists of two apartments, each accessible by a single stairway. The front apartment accessible from a shared entrance with the first floor with the stairs leading to the second floor front apartment and the occupied third floor attic. The rear second floor apartment is accessed from a rear stair attached to the rear of the residence. Number nine, the petitioners exhibit B photos illustrate that the rear stairs is sheathed with wood paneling that violates section 28 which prohibits the use of wood finishes. Conclusion of law, the proposed variance will not substantially adversely affect the law's provisions for health, safety, and security. Strict compliance would entail practical difficulties, unnecessary hardship, and would otherwise be unwarranted because such would be unnecessary in light of alternative switch without a loss in the level of safety, achieve the intended objective of the law. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for the variance from Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Law of New York Multiple Residential Law, Article 3, Section 26, 28, 30, and 31 B and is hereby proposed to be granted with the following conditions. One, that at least two single station smoke alarm devices be provided in the cellar. Two, that a single station smoke alarm be provided on each landing of the exit stairway. Three, that the single station heat alarm be provided on the occupied side of the entrance door of the three dwelling units. Number four, that the above noted smoke and heat alarm shall be interconnected together, either hardwired or be wireless interconnected devices. Five, that the interconnected electrically wired smoke and heat alarms with devices located in the egress path consisting of common stairways, hallways, entrances, and the basement on each story be connected to an alarm panel that notifies occupants and is transmitted to an approved supervising station complying with the Building Codes of New York State, Section 907.2.9. Number six, provide a fire escape ladder at the attic living room and bedroom at the emergency egress windows, be installed per manufacturer's instructions and be maintained. Number seven, that all wood apartment doors be equipped with self-closing devices or self-closing hinges. Number eight, that all wood paneling and doors and stairway, including the basement stairs, wood components, be painted with fire retardant intumescent paint per manufacturer's instruction to obtain a one hour UL designed fire rated assembly and be maintained. Number nine, that the basement door leading to the cellar or basement stairs shall be replaced with the C-label fire rated door with closure or apply intumescent paint to meet the UL rating of 45 minute door with closures. The decision is limited to the specific building and applications before it as contained within this petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications presented in support of this application. I so move. We have a motion by Ms. Sostak. Do I have a second? A second. Mr. Garlock seconds. I'll pull the board. Mr. Ellis? Yay. 
please unmute yourself when you answer. I yes, yay. Australia is still. I have unmuted myself. You can't hear me. Mr. Ellis, we're not hearing you. I Mr. am Molly. unmuted. Hey, Tom, do you hear me? Mr. Badali, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Shaheen Badali yes. voting yes. Mr. Yay. Mr. Ellis? Yay. Do we have that muted on here on the screen? Tom, can, can you hear me? Hold on one second. I, I can hear Mr. Ellis. No, I, I can too. Speakers are on. There's something going on. Mr. Ellis yeah. is on my screen. As muted. I can hear everybody, but they can't okay. hear me. Oh, okay. It's not coming through the speaker here because it's coming through the speaker. I can hear it in my earpiece, so it's problem here. Problem here? Yes. I think it got recorded. So Mr. Badali and Mr. Ellis have both aye. Mr. Garlock? Aye. Ms. Swistek? Aye. Chair votes aye. Five ayes, no nays. Petition is granted. Annette, can you still hear me? Okay. Your speakers? I don't know. We were hearing them earlier. It should all be going good. Yeah, it's, it's not going through the speakers here, Tom. Well, I just disconnected them to see what's going on. Mr. Ellis shows up on my speaker and on my screen. I thought he was switching over. I, yeah. I can hear him with through my earpiece. Nice. Yeah. So whatever I'm hearing, my earpiece should be coming through the speakers or not coming through. Yeah, so I don't know why. We need to get that fixed before we get our next case. I love technology. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, just some. No, can hear okay. you. Can we hear them other speakers here? We hear, can someone talk for me for a minute? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, let's see if we get speakers working anymore. Tom, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Just got to see what the speakers are doing. Okay, can you hear us now? Oh, hold on, Tom. You got to select what you're going to. Can you hear us now? We can hear you. I can still hear you. Did someone reply? That'd be cool. Can you hear me? You know what? Yes, that's it's not worth it. They're not working. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to our next case. Well, let's go on to our second case in the matter of petition number 2022 Petitioners preferred properties MRL. Do anybody, uh, any board members have comments related to this petition? We've, we've even presented the. I'm sorry, I can hear the petition number. Petition number 0434. Okay. Any board members have comments regarding this petition? No. Hearing none, do I have a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Garlock's making a motion. In the matter of a petition of preferred properties, Realty of Central New York or CNY LLC, petition number 
2022-0434 for a variance to the New York State Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code. On the application of preferred properties realty of CNY LLC 179 Valley View Road, New Hartford, New York, filed pursuant to 19 NY CRR 1205 on July 26, 2022, upon all other papers in this matter, the department makes the following determination. Petition pertains to an existing mixed use building with retail use on a first floor and apartments on the two floors above, consisting of approximately 1,450 square feet per floor, totaling 5,800 square feet. The subject building is three stories in height with a basement, wood frame with brick veneer exterior, type 5A protected combustible construction, located at 818-820 Eagle Street, City of Utica, County of Oneida, State of New York. Relief is requested from Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York, Multiple Residence Law, Article 3, Section 30, Cellar Ceilings. In every such dwelling, three stories or more in height, the ceiling of the cellar or the lowest story, if there be no cellar, shall be fire retarded or be equipped with a sprinkler system, unless such ceiling has already been plastered to the satisfaction of the department. Petitioner re requests relief, relief from the requirements for fire rating of the cellar ceiling. The board makes the following findings. The building that is subject of this petition conforms to New York State Multiple Residence Law, Article 2, Section 9, Buildings Converted or Altered, which states, Part 5, it, should, it shall be unlawful to convert a frame dwelling to a multiple residence, except that a frame dwelling not more than two stories and an attic in height and erected before July 1st, 1952, as a one family or two family residence may be converted to a multiple dwelling for permanent occupancy by complying with Article 3, and if such residence is converted to be occupied. Two, the subject building is required to conform to the provisions of Article 3 of the Multiple Residence Law as provided in Section 25 in that it existed on July 1st, 1952, or was converted to a multiple dwelling after July 1st, 1952, and is not a hotel or similar dwelling subject to Article 4 of the Multiple Residence Law. Three, New York State MRL Section 30 requires the lowest story or basement ceiling to be fire rated or protected by a sprinkler system. However, the existing building basement ceiling is not enclosed with fire retardant material nor protected with a sprinkler. A fire in the cellar could easily spread throughout the building if not noticed. There is a mechanical system piping and electrical wiring along the ceiling of the unoccupied cellar, which would make installing a fire retardant ceiling very difficult. Four, the petitioner has stated that the basement has smoke and carbon monoxide detectors present and are connected to the alarm system, which notifies the residents and is connected to a third party monitor and shall be repaired and returned back to service. Five, the applicant has installed an alternative in the form of electrically wired smoke and heat detecting alarms interconnected to a signaling device on each story connecting to an alarm panel that would provide early warning in the event of a fire or related emergency and a signal is sent to a third party, which then notifies the local authorities. The proposed variance will not substantially adversely affect the law's provisions for health, safety, and security. Strict compliance would entail practical difficulties and necessary hardship or would otherwise be unwarranted because such would be unnecessary in light of alternatives which, without a loss in the level of safety, achieve the intended objective of the law. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a variance from Chapter 61B of the Consolidated Laws of New York Multiple Residence Law, Article 3, Section 30, be and is, be and is hereby proposed to be granted with the following conditions. One, that at least two single station smoke alarm devices be provided in the cellar. Two, that a single station smoke alarm be provided on each landing of the exit stairway. Three, that a single station heat alarm be provided on the occupied side of one entrance door to the three dwelling units. Four, that all the 
above noted smoke and heat alarm shall be interconnected together and may be wireless interconnected devices. Five, that the interconnected electrically wired smoke and heat alarms with devices located in the egress path consisting of common stairways, hallways, entrances, and the basement on each story be connected to an alarm panel that notifies occupants and is transmitted to a third party monitor be installed and maintained. This decision is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or spe specifications presented in support of this application. I so move. So the motion by Mr. Garlic. Do I have a second? A second. The Swiss X second, so pull the board. Um to the workers. Mr. Badali? Gene Badali, yay. Okay, Mr. Ellis? Andy Ellis, yay. Okay, Ms. Swistak? Yeah. Mr. Garlock? Aye. And the chair votes ayes. Five ayes, no nays. The petition is granted. Okay. Well, now we'll move on to our next case. Is in the matter of petition 2022-0196, petitioners Cranberry Lake Maria. Do we have the applicant for this? Good good morning. Uh, my name is William Fry, Bill Fry. I am a senior project engineer with CNS Engineers. I reside at uh, 106 Standish Drive, North Syracuse, New York, 13212. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome back, Mr. Fry. Thank you. Shall I present or? Uh, sure. Go ahead and present. May I share my screen? Yes. Yes. Go ahead and share. You should have less. Okay. I six. And hopefully you're seeing the uh, the PowerPoint. Application for variance petition number 2022-0196, is that correct? Yes. Very good. Is there a, a time limit that I should be aware of? Um, you just make your points and keep moving. How long is this gonna take? Okay, the 10 to 15 minutes basically uh, to go through the PowerPoint. And if if, if you'd like, there is a, uh, a safety procedures uh, document that was provided. In fact, this PowerPoint and that safety document were presented or provided to the board a while back. Okay. Is that Just let me verify all board members have received copies of this presentation as well as the safety plan. Mr. Ellis, have you got, did you get copies? Yes, I got copies. Mr. Badali, did you get copies? That's correct. I did and I reviewed them previously. Okay. Uh, Ms. Swistek, yes. okay. So we've all, we've got a copy of your presentations that we've seen for safety plans. So you can make your uh, presentation um, and just cover the high points. Very good, we'll do. Yep. So we're going to just touch on the, the variance request, the uh, facilities that the Environmental Science and Forestry uh, has at Cranberry Lake, uh, the fueling operations and safety document. We'll just touch on the. Uh, the table of contents for that, and we could delve into that if you like. But um, there's also some correspondence with the New York State DEC, and there's an example of some um, some similar facilities that are uh, unattended uh, marina facilities that we'll present. Okay. So as as you all know, these are the uh, uh, the sections from the fire code that we are seeking relief from. The first one that the uh, the dispensing hose not reach within five feet of a building opening. The second one being that supervisors being aware of the hazards inherent in fueling a boat. Uh, the third one being the transfer area containment. And the fourth one uh, is NFPA 30A. Uh, again, the facility shall have an attendant or supervisor on duty. Okay, uh, so the uh, initial application was submitted back on April 19th and the initial hearing on May 19th. So we're, we're following up to that. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can see this okay, but this is uh, an aerial view of Cranberry Lake, and I have my, my cursor pointing at the marina, uh, which is at the north end of the lake. 
the college's uh, ranger school is is on the Oswegatchie River over in this area, and then they have a remote uh, bio, biological station over in this area. Uh, the marina provides fuel for boats that allow uh, staff and students to to go back and forth between the ranger school and the biological station mainly. Okay, uh, the bio school is accessible by car. Uh, the bio station. The ranger school is accessible by car. I apologize if I misspoke. The bio station is only accessible by boat. So the marina is is critical to their operations at the biological station. There there are no other marinas on the lake at all. We have done some research to to confirm that. Um, both the ranger school and the biological station are regulated under the New York State Petroleum Bulk Storage Regulations and the federal SPCC rule uh, because they they have oil for other purposes, fuel oil, for example, for heating buildings. Um, whereas the marina, the only fuel they have is what we're proposing is the 500 gallon unleaded gasoline storage tank. And that threshold falls below the uh, petroleum bulk storage and the SPCC rules. So it's unregulated with regard to those two uh, regulations but the facility will be and is consistent with both of those rules. Okay. Okay, continue. Uh, as, as requested, a, uh, a licensed surveyor surveyed the entire uh, property. Um, the subject marina is at this area, the, the northeast end of it, and we have some photos and some other plans that show that in a little bit more detail. The uh, existing conditions, there is uh, a residence over here. Uh, there is a cold storage building here and over here. Uh, the, the marina basically is this dock right here where there's a dispenser. So the, uh, the dispenser currently is connected to a diesel fuel tank. And the intended scope of work is to remove and get rid of that diesel fuel tank, take an unleaded gasoline tank that's used currently for, uh, for fueling motor vehicles, and relocate that over to the concrete pad where the diesel fuel tank is. So that will be upgraded with current fire and environmental codes. There's underground piping to a dispenser that will be replaced in this area. And I have another uh, figure to show that in a little bit more detail. So this figure shows a proposed above ground storage tank here. Again, it's going to be relocated from elsewhere on the site onto this existing concrete pad the underground piping to a dispenser, which will be replaced with a, a more modern unit. There, um, there will also be some other features I'll talk about shortly. Uh, there is the, uh, the fuel transfer area. So when a vehicle comes in to put fuel into this storage tank, the vehicle will be located in this area onto this concrete pad, which will have containment for, uh, for spills. Uh, there's a, an emergency fuel shutoff over in this area. And we have some uh, spill kits and fire extinguishers throughout the, the marina area. Okay. The uh, storage tank that's going to be utilized is uh, what they refer to as a, a fire guard. It is rated UL 2085. It is a, a double wall tank, double wall steel, above ground tank. The interstitial space is filled with a, a, a lightweight concrete for fire protection. It's equipped with uh, normal and emergency venting, um, high level alarms, um, overfill shutoff valve and, and other uh, fire prevention and, and, and environmental protection features as required by fire code. And again, consistent with the uh, state's petroleum block storage and the federal SPCC rule. The uh, proposed dispenser is a, a, a uh, uh, from Wayne uh, Industries, it's it's uh, consistent with uh, uh, it's utilized as an industry standard for commercial fueling operations as opposed to retail, and this would be a, uh, uh, a commercial type of an application. It will have a, uh, uh, a suction pump inside of here to draw fuel from that above ground storage tank and be operated electronically. The fuel flow will be controlled by way of a, a card reader, a fuel management system. 
uh, that will limit the amount of fuel that can be dispensed per transaction to 25 gallons, which is uh, consistent with the fire code. It's also consistent with uh, the, the DEC's um, opinion uh, that they provided, and I'll, I'll talk on that shortly as well. So you can't access that dispenser. It won't work electronically at all without having a card, a key to access this, and that will en enable the pump, okay? Beneath the dispenser will be a secondary containment UDC under, under dispenser containment. Per, collect any spills or drips that may occur from leaks. We are proposing a hose reel uh, that will uh, include this roller assembly so that the, uh, the hose, when it's extended, uh, will only be directed in one direction, basically, uh, and that will extend out to, uh, to the, where the boats are being fueled. Okay, and it will then rack uh, nicely, so it won't be draped over the top of the dispenser as it currently does, okay? The uh, containment pad where the truck will offload, it'll be a constructed of uh, reinforced concrete. It will have a, a low point sump. It will be designed to contain 20 to 25 gallons, roughly. It will have a control valve on the outlet of that. And if there are any drips or, or sheens of any sort, uh, all flow will go through what is referred to as a petrol plug. It removes uh, hydrocarbons from the stormwater, uh, but allows the water to pass through. So there will be control by way of the valve and treatment by way of the petrol plug. Here's a photograph of the existing fuel dispenser. Uh, there's the cold storage building behind that. Boats. They uh, align out here, they, they dock out here to get fueled. Uh, you can see the hose currently draped over the dispenser that will be replaced again with that hose reel assembly. This is a, a photo of the existing diesel fuel dispenser, which will be removed and replaced by the unleaded gasoline, which is an identical tank. So it will look just like this. The uh, propane tank will be relocated to be consistent with the fire code relocated elsewhere. Another uh, view of the dispenser itself, and behind that, difficult to see from the photo, but the emergency shutoff is located on the on this side of the building behind that dispenser. So uh, again, as requested, we had prepared this marina fueling operations and safety document, and what I have here is the, the table of contents. Uh, the intent is that operators of this of this uh, fuel facility which are all ESF employees, ESF staff, basically. It's their maintenance staff located in the Cranberry Lake region. They will all be trained with this document so that they can become familiar with the, the, the hazards of fueling a boat, basically, okay? Um, in this document, we have an emergency contact list. That contact list is consistent with the facility's SPCC plan for the ranger school and for their uh, bio station. Uh, there's just an introduction, some general safety information about the, the fire triangle and so forth. Um, we have information in here, fire protection and best practices. And, and uh, you are all, you have uh, been provided with that document. So if we need, you'd like me to, to delve into any of it, please let me know. Um, the next section is regarding the stationary storage tank and the filling operation of that tank. There's operating requirements and there's the emergency controls section. Uh, the next section is on the dispensing. So the dispensing of fuel from this dispenser or from the proposed dispenser into the boats, operating requirements, instructions, emergency controls, and uh, in the event of uh, portable containers to be fuel to be filled, there's uh, operations for that. Re release prevention and response. What do they do in the event of a spill? Where are the spill kits? What's in the spill kits? Uh, that kind of information is provided. And then in the, um, uh, the attachments, there is actual fuel transfer policy. Uh, again, the, the college uh, has these in their SPCC plans and they have reviewed all of this information. They are comfortable with the, the transfer policy. And every time fuel is transferred into that storage tank, a bulk transfer checklist will be completed. And then um, if there are any spills, there are spill reporting requirements and a, a form to be completed for, for each and every spill.
so as request we we reached out to the New York State DEC regarding this this uh, this facility and its uh, intended operations and uh, we've got a response from Kevin Kemp from uh, DEC region 7 and he just stated that uh, as long as there's no hole open devices on the dispenser nozzle uh, that would be uh, uh, something he would like to see and there will not be uh, that's a fire code requirement already so we're already consistent with that uh, anti-siphon valves uh, or appropriate appropriate uh, design of the pumping system to prevent siphoning of the tank and we will have a, a solenoid valve that's electronically electrically operated when the dispenser turns on it will uh, energize that valve to open up and allow fuel to flow when the dispenser is is turned off that valve will close and prevent any siphoning situation uh, the amount of fuel pump limited to 25 gallons uh, that's already consistent with the fire code so we're good with that and have a readily available spill kit stocked with oil absorbent pads and booms and again we have that as well prepared example of the, the booms should should spill occur in the water a spill boom would be deployed uh, if it's a small amount they could use just oil absorbent uh, socks or pillows uh, if it's spilled on land this would be used these would be used as well so some examples of other uh, unattended facilities, unattended marinas in uh, upstate, you know, northern New York area. Uh, here's one called Swan Bay Estates and Marina. Uh, the storage tank is in the ground here. The dispenser is right on the marina side, on the dock side. Uh, this does not appear to have any containment for the truck loading, unloading area. Uh, the dispenser has the hose just on the ground. Uh, our facility will have containment for the transfer area and it will have a hose reel. This is another angle of that same facility. It's on the St. Lawrence River. Another one on the St. Lawrence River, Thousand Islands Marina at Millens Bay. Uh, again, the marina uh, dispenser has a card reader. And here's another view of the same dispenser and card reader. Uh, I don't have photos of the of the tank that's remote from this, but again, it did not have uh, containment of the transfer area, whereas uh, the, uh, this college's uh, facility will. And then lastly is one called Martin's Pier 2 Campgrounds and Marina, another uh, unattended marina in on the St. Lawrence River in that general area. Another view of that one. D storage tank in the background, and, and again, no containment of that one. So there are other uh, unattended uh, self-serve fuel facilities throughout the state at DOT facilities, airports, and colleges and universities. They are used uh, in many different types of businesses. Here is one from the central facility in the Syracuse area. Uh, no, nobody attends this. Uh, they just utilize card readers to access it and their operators do their fueling. Here's one at Ithaca Tompkins Regional Airport. Uh, again, it's unattended, self-service fueling. Uh, at high rates of, of flow, by the way, uh, 60 gallons per minute in their diesel diesel units. And even the the, the, the Ranger School has a self-serve fuel facility uh, on their property as well. So it's commonly done. Um, it's um, basically we feel as though the, it's not regulated by the, the Petroleum Bulk Storage or SPCC rule, but it will be designed and operated consistent with both of those so they've gone above and beyond with regard to the the environmental protection um, it's it's clear that this marina is critical to the operations of esf and they're they're called to have students and, and their learning objectives to access the biological station so it's it's critical they they need this facility um, it's not practical to have a full service attendant there when each of the uh, uh, ESF uh, staff are basically, each one of them is an attendant. They're all gonna be trained in uh, the safe um, operation and uh, fire protection, uh, fire prevention measures uh, that were mentioned in that fueling operations and safety document. Um, so we are requesting relief from those items from the from the, uh, that are mentioned in the variants. Uh, and if, if you'd like more detail, I'd be happy to provide that. Uh, but that kind of summarizes what I had 
prepared to to present. Um, there are a couple of folks from from ESF on the call, and if, if any of them would like to to chime in, I, I welcome that. Uh, otherwise, uh, that kind of concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fry. Let me uh, pull the board and see if we have any members that have any questions. Um, Mr. Ellis, do you have any questions for the applicant? I, I do have one question. Um, you said that you're pulling the tank out that's currently being used for to fill motor vehicles. So the pump at the, the new the proposed pump is not going to fuel vehicles. It's only for boats. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's all the questions I had. Okay. Uh, Mr. Badali, do you have any questions for the applicant? Thank you. I, I just had one. I wasn't sure if this was mentioned. Uh, there was talk of the of training as a class C operator. I was curious how many operators do we expect to be trained and, and, and be available, let's say? Uh, for, per, yeah. Uh, great question. I, I'm not entirely certain. I know there are at least a half a dozen folks that are at the uh, uh, that provide uh, maintenance for the Ranger School, for the Marina, and for the Bio Station, and they they work in each of those three locations. All of those folks will be will be go through this training, which will include that safety document that has that has been mentioned and provided to you. And uh, with regard to the Class C operators, uh, the New York State DEC requires uh underground storage tank facilities to have a uh, a class a b and c operator uh, there is no underground storage tank here but the training for a class c operator is the the basics so if you were operating a convenience store for example and you're behind the counter you were required to be trained uh, to a level c so that you're uh, aware of where the tank is where the dispensers are where the emergency shutoffs are who to call in the event of an emergency the basics for emergency response and we feel as though the safety document is prepared goes way above and beyond that uh, but we thought that we would also include that kind of information in the training session so i hope that answers your question and uh, P peter marshall if you have any anything to add to that with regard to the staff or john we feel, feel free to, to chime in on that Um, this is Peter Marshall uh, representing the uh, ESF facilities office. Um, I think uh, what Bill stated is is pretty accurate that uh, um, you know we we could have uh, you know four, five, six uh, staff at the uh, um, up up at Cranberry Lake who who could potentially be fueling. Uh, Marine uh, crafts up there. Um, one other one other thing that I I think is worthy of mentioning is that we currently have a uh, a gasoline tank at our uh, Cranberry Lake bio station, which is across the lake from the marina we're talking about here. Um, by um, you know moving our marine fueling to the to the bio station, our intent is to close down the tank that's across the lake. And so we would no longer have a need to transfer fuel across the lake, which which would uh, re reduce a lot of uh, environmental risk, you know, for a spill. So you know, that, that that's that's a big factor, I think, too. Okay. Thank you. That does answer my question. Okay, uh, Mr. Garlock, do you have any questions? Um, yes, I just have one question. Um, it's been discussed and it's part of the, uh, the presentation that the maximum amount of fuel that will be dispensed is 25 gallons under any single transaction. Um, would it be prudent to ensure that the spill containment at the dispensing facility would be, it was discussed to be 20 to 25 gallons. Can we ensure that it would at least be 25 gallons? Is that a prudent measure? The, uh, 
the fuel transfer from over the road trucks into the storage tank containment system. We did say 20 to 25 gallons. We can ensure that there will be 25 gallons containment there. With regard to the dispensing from the dispenser into boats, uh, that is a 25 gallon limit as, as well. Okay, but there's a little bit little bit difference between the two. Uh, it just so happens both quantities are, are consistent. But the uh, dispensing into boats, 25 gallons maximum, the uh, dispenser will shut off and it'll have to be reset to dispense any more than than that. Uh, and there's only one one boat that they have that that ha that would require maybe two boats that would that that would apply to that they would have to turn it off and then reset it uh, to dispense further. Uh, majority of their boats hold less than 25 gallons, basically, but only two of them have more than that. I hope that answers your question. Yep, thank you. Sure. Mr. Sustak, do you have any questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, just a couple minor questions. Um, when I was reading through your safety plan, um, you said that uh, you would be using a UL listed uh, a dispensing handle with, uh, with safety cut off, um, but it would not have a hold open device. Um, the one thing we've seen a couple of times in, um, in, our, in our, some of our installations where I, my jurisdiction is that sometimes they take a UL listed handle that has a safety catch on it and they remove that safety or the hold open device. And actually it, 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 it takes away the listing. So that was the only question I had is you are going to use a UL listed without the without the hold open device. Co correct. Okay. Those nozzles can be obtained without the hold open device to maintain the UL rating. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure that somebody's not coming in and bringing one and dismantling it, which takes us. And the second question I have is about the reel. Is that a UL listed for fuel dispensing? The hose reel. Yes, it is. It okay. would be ma manually operated, not not electronically. So it basically spring loaded. Yes. Okay, but it is a listed reel then. Okay, that's, great. That's correct. I have no further questions. Uh, just uh, quickly around the board. Uh, any more follow up questions to any of the members of the applicant team? Okay. Well, thank you. This uh, I said certainly uh, addresses a lot of the questions we had and concerns that at least I had uh, during the last. Our, our last hearing discussion on this event, uh, what you've done here is, uh, uh, is is very, very good and very exceptional job. Thank you. Okay, um, for now, we are going to recess uh, while we deliberate, and then we'll be back to you in about 10 minutes or so. Okay, so we, Annette, we can go off the record. Okay. We're coming out of our recess. Uh, we'll continue our conversation regarding petition number 2022-0196, uh, petitioners Cranberry Lake Marina. Uh, let's see, we have the applicants online here. Mr. Fry, where are you? There he is. Okay, thank you. All right, so right now um, I'm going to entertain a motion from board member. Yes, I'd like to make a motion. Okay, Mr. Garlock would like to make a motion. With respect to the petition of the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, petition number 2022-0196, requesting adherence to the following sections of the Uniform Code. Petitioner is seeking relief from the requirements of Title 19 Part 1225, the Uniform Fire Prevention Building Code. Petition pertains to a variance for the relocating of an existing unleaded fuel tank, fuel dispensing cabinet testing, and replacing fuel lines as required at the SUNY ESF Marina, servicing the SUNY ESF Biological Field Station at Cranberry Lake. Subject structures are known as the State, of, State University of New York College of Environmental Sciences and Forestry, Cranberry Lake Marina, located at 437 Columbian Road, Town of Clifton, St. Lawrence County, New York State. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1225, 2020, Fire Code of New York State, 
section 2303.1 location of dispensing devices, which states that dispensing devices shall be located as follows. Or such that the nozzle where the hose is fully extended will not reach within five feet of building openings. The petitioner requests that they be allowed to install it, the new fuel dispensing cabinet with with the 25 feet hose in the former location and allow additional ESF staff to a class C operator consistent with New York State DC underground storage tank UST training program. Relief is also requested from 19 NY CRR part 1225 2020 fire code of New York State section 2310.1 marine motor fuel marine motor fuel dispensing facilities, which states that the construction of marine motor fuel dispensing facilities shall be in accordance with the building code of New York State and NFPA 30A. The storage of class 1, 2, or 3A liquids at marine motor fuel dispensing facilities shall be in accordance with this chapter and chapter 57. Petitioner requests that they be allowed to utilize ESF staff to a class C operator consistent with New York State DEC underground storage tank training program, along with the enhanced training to be fully aware of the operation mechanics and hazards of fueling boats. Relief is also requested from 19 NY CRR part 1225 2020 fire code New York State section 2310.3.2 supervision marine motor fuel dispensing facility shall have an attendant or supervisor who is fully aware of the operation mechanics and hazards inherent to fueling of boats on duty whenever the facility is open for business. The attendant's primary function shall be to supervise, observe, and control the dispensing of class one, two, or three A liquids or flammable gases. The petitioner requests that they be allowed to utilize ESF staff to a class C operator consistent with New York State DEC underground storage tank training program, along with enhanced training to be fully aware of the operation mechanics and hazards of fueling boats. Relief is lastly requested from 19 NY CRR part 1225 2020 fire code of New York State section 5706.5.1.5 spill control and secondary secondary containment, which states that areas where transfer operations are located shall be provided with spill control and secondary containment in accordance with section 5703.4. The spill control and secondary containment system shall have a design capacity capable of containing the capacity of the largest tank compartment located in the area where transfer operations are conducted. Containment of the rainfall volume specified in section 5004.2.2.6 is not required. Petitioner requests to allow federal oil pollution prevention rule at 40 CFR. Part 112, the Spill Prevention Control and Countermeasures Rule, or SPCC, to allow for the most likely spill size of a maximum of 20 to 25 gallons following the prescribed methods and additional containments, containment devices, such as absorb, absorb, absorption materials and pads. The board makes the following findings. Structure subject one structure subject to the petition is known as State University of New York College of Environmental Sciences and Forestry, Cranberry Lake Marina, located at 437 Columbian Road, Town of Clifton, St. Lawrence County, New York State. Two, the building that is the subject of this petition is properly classified <clears throat> under 19 NY CRR Part 1221, Section 309.1. Mercantile Group M, Mercantile Occupancy Shell, but not be limited to motor fuel dispensing facilities, 311.2, Moderate Hazard Storage, Group S1, Motor Vehicle Repair Garages, complying with the maximum allowable quantities of hazardous materials. Section 312.1, Utility and Miscellaneous Group U, Group U shall include tanks. Three. The structures, the structures that are the subject of this petition 
are properly classified under 19 NY CRR part 1221 section 602.5 type 5 construction that is the type of construction of any materials permitted by this code, the tanks, docks, and supporting structures. Four, fire code section 2303.1 states that the dispensing devices shall be located such that the nozzle where the hose is fully extended will not reach within five feet of building opening. Building one and building two are within reach of the 25 feet fuel dispensing hose and that openings can be subject to accidental spills into the interior. Five, the petitioner and owner proposed to train the ESF staff as a Class C operator and additional training on the operation mechanics and hazards of fueling boats. Six, the applicant has submitted alternative measures, measures such as specifying that Federal Oil Pol Pollution Prevention Rule 40 CFR Part 112 spill prevention control and counter measures such as following the prescribed methods and stationing and stationing additional containment devices such as absorption materials and pads about the dispensing cabinet. The intent is to provide the same level of safety. Seven, the petitioner states in the narrative exhibit one that each of the four code sections are impractical to comply with given the environmental conditions, the limited access to employees, and that the previous and continued operation will not in any appreciable way change. Eight, the design team initiated a dialogue with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. The DEC reviewers provided guidance on how to effectively reduce petroleum products near the waterfront, control storage tank refills, provide updated dispensing systems and practices to avoid possible accidental spill events. Nine, the petitioners provided additional submission which is an operations and safety manual, which addresses safe operation and procedures for receiving, storing, dispense, and dispensing of fuel at the marina. 10, the petitioner has consulted with the local authorities having jurisdiction, the New York State ESF in-house code official, and the official has stated the, that the office supports the petition. 11, this at variance. This variance will not substantially adversely affect provisions for health, safety, and security. In accordance with the above findings, the board finds that in the case before it, strict compliance with the provisions of the New York State Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code would entail practical difficulties and unnecessary hardships. <laughs> and would be unnecessary in light of alternatives which ensure achievement of the code's intended objective or in light of, the, in light of alternatives which, without a loss in level of safety, achieve the code's intended objective more efficiently, effectively, or economically. Therefore, I move that the above petition be granted. In view of the above findings, the board find a view above Excuse me. In view of the above findings, the board notes that strict compliance with the code would entail practical difficulties, unnecessary hardship, or would otherwise be unwarranted because such would be created an ex excessive and a reasonable economic burden, would be unnecessary in light of the alternatives, which without lo loss and level of safety achieve the intended objective of the code. <clears throat> This decision is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specifications pre presented in support of this application. So moved. Thank you. We have a motion. Do I have a second? A second. Okay, Ms. Swiss seconds. Poll the board. Mr. Badali. Shaheen Badali, aye. Mr. Ellis. Andy Ellis, aye. Ms. Glistak. Aye. Mr. Garlock. Aye. And the chair votes ayes. Five ayes, no nays. Uh, addition and variance is granted. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay.
Um, We will now hear um, our next case, which is in the matter of uh, this will be the fourth hearing. This is in the matter of petition 2022 0473. Um, petitioners, New York State 330, uh, Indian Castle. Um, in the fifth hearing, we'll also hear uh, comments relative to that, which is petition. Number 022-074, New York State Thruity Authority, Chittenango. And the sixth hearing is also in the matter of petition number 2022-0475, New York State Thruity Authority, Junius Ponds. Um, because all three of these cases involve the same issue, uh, we're going to lump the discussions unless there's something we need to segment uh, those uh, two pieces out, okay? So, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, the other applicants would like to come in uh, previously. It's all right, they asked before the, the next proceeding started, would we be able to come in to get a feel for how the oh, sure. hearings are done? Yep, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so we need a camera for these folks. Uh, I think we're going to have you sit in these two front chairs. And uh, we're going to ask you to each individually state your name and your address. Okay. If you're going to speak, and then yes. we'll go down the line. Okay. I'm going to wait for a couple more people to step in the room. Okay. Okay, so all three of these cases are open now, so we're going to lump the conversations. And if there's any segmenting of cases because of one facility is slightly different than the other, we can talk about that. But uh, yeah. so, okay, so state your name and your address. I'm uh, Theodore George Mucho, Senior Vice President with the Com Tishman. Uh, home address is 25 Parkview Avenue, Bronxville, New York, 10708. Okay, could you spell your last name for the court reporter? Yes, uh, Amazon Mary, U-S-H-O. Okay, let me just check. Uh, Annette, did you get that? Okay. Okay, say your name and your address. My name is Richard Bly, 3879 Ontario Drive, Wheatfield, New York, 14120. And I'm the general foreman for the John W. Dan for the company. Kevin Shuttlebar, project executive for the John W. Dan for the company, 180 Dumont Terrace, Tonawanda, New York, 14223. Thank you. Okay. I didn't get his name at all. Kevin Shuttlebar, I'll spell it for you S C H E D L B A U E R. Okay. All right, so go ahead and uh, whoever's doing the presentation, you go. I will, uh, I will be doing Okay. Uh, good morning, board. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I am with uh, ACOM Tishman. Uh, our subject of petition is uh, requesting a variance to the plumbing code, uh, section 312, uh, testing of degrees. Uh, waste line and sanitary, uh, having utilized the smoke test to set out the attached documentation, which I, I believe everybody's received copies of, uh, in lieu of a water test as prescribed by code. Uh, this testing approach was taken due to weather and temperatures at the time uh, of testing. Uh, we believe we are eligible uh, for the variance based on upon five of the basis for variance. Uh, would be unnecessary in the light of uh, the alternative approach we've taken. Um, to summarize, um, given the below freezing temperatures, uh, a competition determined the safest, most effective approach to testing uh, per the advice of Dan Ford, our plumbing contractor, uh, was to utilize uh, smoke rather than water. Um, an RFI was written to the engineer of record for the project. Uh, they accepted this alternate testing method uh, with freezing temperatures. 
Uh, as you noted, there were three locations in which we employed this, this approach. Uh, they were um, Indian Castle, uh, Chittenango, and Junior's Ponds. Uh, these are three of the 27 sites uh, that we as builders uh, are uh, renovating, uh, replacing the plazas along the New York State Thruway. Uh, we are the design builder uh, contracted to Apple Green, the operator on behalf of the New York State Thruway, to either rebuild or refurbish these 27 sites uh, along the New York State Thruway. The buildings uh, range uh, in size from level one structures, approximately 4,800 square feet, to level two structures, 5,900 square feet, uh, and level B's uh, uh, beyond. Um, what we are seeking a variance for uh, the level twos, all of which are 6,195 uh, square feet. Um, they replace existing structures on the same sites and provide bathroom facilities, quick service restaurants uh, to the traveling public. Um, the present conditions are uh, a competition to design builders completing the final punch list for the requirements of Indian Castle uh, was the first of the structures to be completed. Uh, Chittenango is now also complete and Junius Ponds is uh, soon to follow. Uh, in our final walkthroughs and assembling the final documentation for certificate of occupancy, uh, when we recognize the need to uh, request the variance. Um, so in closing, uh, we're requesting a variance from the plumbing code uh, 3.12.2 testing requirement described as shall be filled with water. Uh, shall not be tested with less than 10 feet of head of water, substituting an alternative testing procedure utilizing smoke and point to type 2 uh, 2D candles generating 16,000 cubic feet of smoke. Um, it's uh, I have uh, these two representatives uh, from Dan Forth that uh, are employing all of our plumbing work on the sites. Uh, they advised us at the time, as I noted in our our variance request here uh, that this was the best approach given the weather conditions. Um, and they can describe more completely uh, the testing procedure uh, as well. I think it's important to note uh, we had representatives uh, from the thruway as well as we were present uh, and other uh, represented presence when they were tested and they all passed. Um, so if there's if you'd like, we can either go into the description of the testing process or leave that to questions, or how would you care to proceed? Um, well, let me ask, I'd like to pull the board members to see if uh, they have any questions. Um, let me start with Mr. Badali. Do um, you have any questions for the applicant? Yeah, uh, could you please just briefly describe what the difference was between the level one and the level two building, please? Uh, it really has to do with size. Uh, it's oh. footage. Yeah, so the little ones, uh, they have uh, the, the leveling descriptions uh, have to do with the numbers of QSRs, which are quick service restaurants that are within them. Uh, so in the level ones, you had one. We go up to level the level twos, which we're speaking about today, had two. Uh, and then there's the associated toilets uh, and other uh, services, plumbing requirements that are necessary for those types of sites of buildings. Understood. Thank you. Welcome. That was Mr. Ellis, do you have any questions for the applicants? Uh, yeah, the smoke test was documented properly uh, in accordance yeah. to what? Yes, it, yes, it was. Uh, the smoke test was done at the completion of the underground sanitary and greaseway systems, and it was uh, documented and witnessed by um, members of the Tishman and uh, with Chase team, and also with the uh, representative of the New York State Thruway Authority. Just to, to further uh, provide some information within uh, the applicant itself, application itself, uh, we provided the, um, uh, the testing reports. Uh, and also a description of the means by which uh, it, the testing was uh, implemented. Um, we're, we're glad to describe or provide any further uh, information you would like, just in, in the time respecting the time. Period. The time requirements for the tests were completed for every building, or was one of them not completed? They were all completed. 
All right. Mr. Ellis, do you have any more questions? I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's okay. I'm good. Mr. Garla. Okay. Um, my comments are pretty straightforward. Um, this plumbing code applies to all the state, and I've not seen one exception because it got too cold for not doing these tasks. I don't understand. I talked to a, a, a plumbing inspector this morning in this how They said, what do you do in the winter? They said, uh, we pick a warmer day to do it, and if need be, we'll put antifreeze in the system to do it. And to do a, a smoke test is not the same as a water test. The results can be very different. There's an intent for a water test. So the question I have is, once you realize you didn't, why didn't you just do a water test anyways? You could have capped all the drains. You could have built the water up to the vent stack, and you could have done the same test. I know I'm going to open up some sheetrock, but this was found months ago when, when this test was done in February. Why, why didn't you just go and do the water test? It still could be done today. It's just you're talking about maybe having to go for some sheetrock and things like that. So I guess I don't understand why you didn't go back and do a water test. Well, maybe I can, I can start and I'll yeah. turn it over to them. Uh, first off, when we performed the test this way, based on the uh, response we had from our design professional, we thought it was acceptable. Uh, and they'll explain a little bit more later as to why the smoke test was performed the way it was. Uh, we are in part here at this time uh, because there are hardships associated, as you point out, uh, to conducting the test uh, as is intended, uh, which we can get into in greater detail if you if you like. Uh, it's not quite as simple as just some drywall access here and there. So we'll we'll discuss that in greater detail. One point to be made relative to um, many, uh, if not all, of these sites uh, are environmentally sensitive, uh, and to use glycol uh, specifically on a site and to applying them. Uh, in a uh, scenario in which you're discussing, uh, exposes those sites to some uh, uh, risk environmentally. Uh, and generally, it's not practiced by us in those situations. And I'll turn that over to uh, both uh, Kevin and uh, Richard to discuss further. Yeah, so to, I guess to answer your first question as to why the decision was made at the time, um, the site conditions were on the throughway. It was open. There was no enclosed building. And the site, uh, because of the size of the underground system, some of these tests took multiple days in order to fill and allow the water and the air to settle. And then they had to be refilled because the inspectors weren't all present all of the time during the sites. So someone would have a conflict coming down the throughway or couldn't be there at the time. So the, the test would last multiple days. And in order to leave that standing water in there uh, and open dishes, allowed for like subjects for freezing and cracking on traps. So the thought was to do the smoke tests and move the water test to protect multiple days of testing. They could be performed relatively quickly while the inspecting parties were all on site at the same time. So that was why the RFI was originally written. And it didn't deviate from the code too much. Uh, 3.12.4 allows for a final smoke test. Um, so there was not, we, we didn't believe we were taking liberties with the test or with the uh, with the code outside of making a final test through the stack as opposed to just an underground test. The, the problem with the smoke test is once you get everything closed, the smoke may not come out of a wall or a joint and you may not know if you have a leak. That's this, the problem. There, not, and that's the difference between the water is that you know if there's a leak, that water level changes. Right. And the smoke test. You can put smoke in there for 15 minutes and you may not know you have a leak because you have no pressure variation. There's not enough pressure differential to validate whether you have a leak or not, especially if it's an occult leak somewhere in the system that you can't see it. I understand it's a final, it's just to make sure that there's no gross breaks, but that's the whole point of the water test is to make sure you don't have a leak that doesn't show up. I mean, you certainly don't want it if it's in the ground, you don't want it to infiltrate in either direction. So I'm still stretching my head why in on three sites on this New York State Thruway, the weather conditions are different than in Rochester or Buffalo or Syracuse or Albany or Binghamton, where they're built buildings during the wintertime and did plumbing. 
for you probably you may have done some of those yeah and i understand some of the inspectors may not be enforcing water but they're plotted what plumbing inspectors because water authorities are involved they do look higher water tests and they did them in the winter and they were able to to, to, to accomplish those so i'm still don't understand why you, you as soon as you realize you didn't do it or you should have known you should have done it and it didn't get done the engineer doesn't get you out of the code no no and there was no intention to get out of the code again we we didn't think we were deviating from it and just to back uh, back up a little bit there was no enclosed walls when we were doing this contest. Right. It was an open site with open ditches. There were no joints that were covered. Everything was open. Um, when did you do the smoke test? Uh, yeah, January. January. January and February. And uh, so at the time of the testing, there was no, we could see everything that was being tested. There was no joint or section of pipe that was covered. And um, again, so the, Again, that was part of the reason for the decision to use the smoke is because everything was so open to the environments. And at other sites, as you refer to in Buffalo, we are doing water testing because of you know, the time of year we're doing this. The different sites throughout the through which are being done at different times based on scheduling. And uh, there was no knowledge of us needing to come for this variance because we didn't actually know we were out of compliance until uh, final documentation was being reviewed by the New York State Thruway Authority and Tishman. Yeah, and I think the other side, like we, we did things where we thought were above board by doing all these paperwork documentations, having it witnessed, that sort of thing. And right. I think, so we thought we were doing the right thing in this case to comply with what we, what everybody needed us to comply with. I think now we're at the point where this, this facility is all very operational. Now filling them up is definitely not practical, aside from just opening up gravel. That's just an architectural change. We get that. I think, uh, you know, when you talk about bathrooms being in use at this point and now filling it up with water and test ball bowls out, it's definitely going to be a little bit of an issue there for sure. Right. So that there is that application to look at for the where we're at right now. And, and I know this is um, another thing to address is, is schedule. Uh, when the piping was done uh, and uh, uh, approved, the testing was approved, uh, we have a construction. Uh, a construction schedule, uh, a schedule obligation to the state. Uh, our interpretation was, as we've been discussing, we thought it satisfied, uh, and we proceeded to construct uh, the following trades, uh, as you would expect. So they, we were under uh, schedule constraints uh, in order to move the work forward. Um, there are a couple of alternatives, as you described. Um, we felt. Uh, at that particular time, for the reasons we've set out, uh, you know, the environmental concerns, uh, the protection of the installed work, uh, and concerns about freezing, uh, and then also the following activities that needed to be done uh, that uh, we were performing in the best interest of the project, uh, the state, uh, and uh, our obligations to schedule. Um, yeah, I mean. You know, if you're a small plumbing outfit, I probably have a little bit more sympathy towards the situation, but you know, you're a significant plumbing contractor. This code's not a new code. Yeah, I don't know, no. I, I, I just struggle with this whole situation because I know that there are other plumbing, significant plumbing contracts down state, around the state in different jurisdictions are doing water tests, even if it's cold. They're working with the plumbing inspectors and, and, and everybody else to make sure they get it done. I just. So this isn't the first time, though, that we perform smoke tests in different municipalities across the state. I've personally done quite a few of them in Buffalo where the circumstances just warrant the smoke test, whether it's uh, occupancy or, you know, conflicting weather that has nothing to do with freezing. But if there's a building that's not weather tight and there's water everywhere, we've done smoke tests in the past just to kind of verify that we do have a good install. I mean, the intent of this was never to get around the code. We all had the best intentions, went into this with the best um, attempt to do the job correctly for the clients and the customers and the state and everyone. There was no circum there was no intentional circumventing of the code. Again, looking at two paragraphs over and seeing there are smoke tests available per the code, right. and then looking at what we RFI to the engineer record to make sure everybody was on the same page. And then having that documentation, we were gonna do this at these sites. And then knowing that we were going to um, have a good install and then go forward, 
there was never any looking back to say, oh, we, we should head test this, head test this again. Mostly because at that point in time when the weather would have cooperated with the building was enclosed, we had already had a sign test report that was valid and there were there was progress on the job that would have prevented us from doing a typical test fixtures on the wall that would have had to be removed and, and everything else so when this, when this became an issue that we were aware of it was we thought we still had done the right thing by getting an rfi response and complying with the code to that next section and and didn't think that we had any issue really that we had to worry about so i i would also offer for some that uh, Danforth, uh, in particular, is uh, their reputation as uh, plumbing contractors and mechanical contractors uh, is uh, beyond reproach. Uh, and to their point and, and to mine, uh, there was never an intention to circumvent the code. Um, any competition uh, as a builder, uh, we're downstate. Uh, we have been in business for over 120 years uh, and we're fully aware of the responsibilities we have as a builder to perform uh, responsibly and professionally uh, and I can tell you there was never a conversation on any of our parts to uh, circumvent the code uh, we thought we were uh, performing uh, again uh, in the best interests of the project uh, and in our minds uh, consistent with what the code intent was the water test is intended. It's the it's the high. I mean, the alternative is if, if you weren't using plastic, you could do an air test. I mean, they give you that option, but you didn't have that option. So the water test is is the is the gold standard to leak. And then the last test is that final test. But that doesn't meet the same quality of testing that the water test does. If you're putting ten feet ahead on top of pipes, you're going to see leakage pretty easily if you're going to have that problem particularly unsanitary, but when you get into the, the smoke test, it's it's kind of like that one last check through. It's like doing the final sprinkler test after you've already done zone testing on it. You do one more just to make sure it's still gonna hold and the, they allow the smoke test because you got traps and things like that already in place. I get that. And that's kind of what the assumption, why this smoke test is done. It's they knew you have all your fixtures in place, so it's easy to plug. You really can't do the water at that point. but I can I can just say that you know I know that there are jurisdictions that have gone too far at the backtrack and do the water test afterwards. And, uh, Junius Ponds and Chittenango and uh, what's the other one? Indian, Castle. Indian Castle. I've driven the throughway and I know that they were under there. You know it was pretty much spring construction most all the spring. So that's kind of like I'm trying to figure out why they didn't go back and get a water test after you do it, but you did do it till. You got to see oh, is that my No, that that came about because that was the moment in time when you know, we were alerted that uh, the throughway was not accepting that as a standard test. We at the time we did it thought it why. Um, I think the the other comments to, to just be made is that the, the buildings are functioning as intended uh, at this time. We're not experiencing any issues with the plumbing or otherwise. Uh, there's no uh issues that that are coming to light at this point so uh, granted there the the testing to the standard and to using water test was not done uh in in that regard but they they are functioning i think what may be worth uh, uh commenting on now is is just the the hardship at this point uh and being able to uh institute this testing now uh, and I think I, I'm going to turn that over to uh, to Kevin to, to explain that uh, they're significant uh, and uh, impactful to the traveling public. But Kevin, sure. I think uh, let me just highlight one other thing. We said we the next site on the dock is really Iroquois, and we did a smoke test on that site. We actually went back and hydro tested that one because it was a bit more practical to do it because the entire construction is not done; it's holding and signed off by the New York State Thruway Authority inspectors. So we believe it is a fairly competent. Uh, meeting the objective of the test understood is not the same. I get that. Um, we get that. And, uh, you know, we've been a local company for a long period of time. As you noted before, we have no intention of going anywhere. We stand behind our work. We've been here for a long period of time. We we do know what we're doing. And again, we thought we were doing everything above board. And, I, and just to further highlight that, you know, 
going back at this junction with all those systems being in use with Reese and uh, basically the bathrooms in use, that is definitely not a path we would like to pursue. And obviously, we understand some of the implications of doing that and having something go wrong during those, those time periods, right? So that that's why we're asking for the variance. Any questions? Yeah, do you mind going into detail a little bit about what testing facility now might look like and what you define, you know, the hardships in terms of time, money, and those, you know, it's, it's easy to just to go back. One thing to say there's a hardship to do it, but without really, we don't have any evidence of that really. So, in order for us to do a Standing water test on one of these. You're talking about the three sites. Yes, yeah, just describe the space the most. So they would have to be closed down. We would have to disconnect every trap, remove every fixture, um, cap every fixture, cap every waistline, and every floor fixture would have to be uh, opened up and then plugged off. And then you would have to go out into the uh, manhole outside of the building and plug that off. And then Fill from inside of the roof stack. Or, I'm sorry, fill from the <coughs> vent stack on the roof, which would also give you more than 10 foot ahead. So we would have a standing test of more than 10 foot ahead. That's the that's the procedure. You know, the, yeah, in terms of time frame, I think it's probably a couple of days. And obviously, you guys noted that there was uh, architectural finishes and whatever else that would have to be opened up and put back in place. At, um, in addition to what we just noted, and all the people that are working there consistently have to be sent home for that period of time and then have to come back. And with within that, just to deal with some of the um, collateral uh, issues, um, the traveling public would be closed. There'd be longer distances between the ability for them to stop. Typically, the way that our contract was structured, uh, no more than uh, 40 miles, which is generally every other, uh, which now we're getting into a cycle of the second uh, facilities to be revised. Um, Kevin spoke about that so all of the uh, employees that are at those locations uh, would be, uh, going to use the word, laid off for this period of time. Uh, we would have to uh, perform this work. Generally, it's somewhere between three days to a week. Uh, there's all the stored material, foodstuffs, uh, which typically have an expiration date associated with them. That would then be generated as waste. Uh, there would then have to be, if, if you know, any of the finishes would have to be adjusted, there'd be a level of cleaning that would have to take place. We're probably looking in the range of somewhere with, uh, at least two weeks, maybe three. Is Junius Ponds open? Uh, Junius Ponds is not open yet. The two that we have open are Indian Castle. There's some training there, I think. Uh, there, yes, there is training that's occurring right now. But it's not open to the dry line. Oh, the junior response. Yes, sir. Have you performed the water tests from existing facilities previously? Uh, other you know types of facilities to test an existing waste infrastructure? No, if an existing waste infrastructure needed to be tested, a small test is usually required. For the domestic systems, when were those installed and how were those tested? Uh, there's stages of testing the domestic systems. <clears throat> the underground is done during the underground portion. Um, and then the uh, above. I was just trying to think of the, you're asking the date, but when they were tested. Well, or the present procedure or date? Yeah, date and procedure for testing the domestic system. So, and that's not in front of us, but I'm just. No, the, the domestic system needs to be very uh, tested after finish, well, not after finishes, but in rough stage above ground. Mm -hmm. So the building's enclosed, there's temporary heat supply, and it's a hydrostatic test, 150 pounds. No, that, so that was performed and inspected. Yes, that's correct. But again, it's done later, and the building had walls and it had temporary heat at that point. Okay. All right. Before we go, the deliberation. Let me just check back in with uh, Andy Ellis. Any questions? I'm good right now. Shaheen Badali, any questions? No. 
Gail Slistek, any questions? Can the Junius Pond Service Center have the test done before they open, or are you beyond that point? It would be a similar circumstance to the other ones. I, the only, I guess, say, fundamental difference between those two, obviously, it's not in full operation, right? So there is still employees that are working there that are that have jobs that would have to be sent home while we're doing these tests. Um, so. Not quite as invasive, but there's still all the other things stacked up, which is a little bit less on there because it's not fully operational for the public. And all the fixtures, et cetera, are already in place. Yeah, that's yes. Yes. Oh, okay. cool. They are doing employee training. All right. Hearing none, we're going to go into recess and deliberate. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Can we go off the On the record. Okay, we are now going to reopen the hearing in regards to petitions uh, 2022475, 2022-473, and 2022-474. Um, I just need a couple questions to confirm. Junius Ponds is not occupied by the public yet, correct? But it has employees staff working there. Correct. <laughs> okay. Before I read um, and make a motion on these uh, petitions, and the chair will read all three petitions separately, um, I think uh, it's a consensus of most of the members on the board that the water test is not the same as the smoke test as far as equivalence of performance and that the water test should have been performed on this building. And uh, I think in light of the hardship, because these buildings are already occupied, that it's probably why this is gonna, we're gonna why I'm gonna make a motion to grant this variance. But had you come to us you know, two or three months ago, um, I, I don't see it was likely you would have been granted a variance. I think it's just the clock is run out on this. And I think, um, and I can tell you from my experience on the board, and uh, I am not aware of ever having uh, a contractor, a developer, somebody coming to the board to get a variance on a required test, um, particularly this test. And so this is new territory. And I just want to make it clear that you know, from Danforth or from Tishner that if you do another project, I don't care whether it's the dead of winter, you need to do a water test. That's what the code requires. They're, they're two different separate tests. They're not the same. They're, they're clearly, I know that some people would say they're equivalent, but they're not. Water is the higher standard, and that's why they even grant you the to segment the test into different pieces so that as you complete the building, you can put it all together. And that's where the final smoke test comes into play is to, you got everything glued together, do one more test. For gross, somebody didn't connect the pipe. 
one of the concerns this board had in, in our conversations um, is that what happens if there's a problem that's a cult and five, six, seven years, and then we have there's a washout because you have a drain leak that didn't get picked up on your smoke test or what happens, you know, if that happens. And you have no we don't have a water test to prove that ever happened. So there's there's a concern that you know what happens to this building, you know, something bad happens. So that's why we believe that all these tests are important to complete. But because of this certain hardship that you have with this situation, I think this is where we're headed. Okay, so I'll make it pretty clear. So thank you. All right. So and the chair will make following motion in regards to dish number uh, 2022-0473. Um, petitioner is Robert Bacardi of AECOM, AECOM Tishman. The petitioner petition pertains to a variance for plumbing test what is known as the New York State Thruary Authority Indian Castle service site. Total floor area of 6,195 square feet, construction type 2B, one story in height, located on Interstate 90, New York State service area MP210, town of Danube, that's how I pronounce it, County of Herkimer, State of New York. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1222, the Plumbing Code, Section 312.2, which states that a water test shall be applied to the drainage system either in its entirety or in sections. If applied to the entirety of the system, the system shall be submitted to a test of not less than 10 feet of head of water. Pressure shall be held for not less than 50 minutes. The test shall be in be then, excuse me, the system shall then be tight at all points. The petitioner is seeking relief or variance to allow for a pressurized smoke test in lieu of the required water test due, due to the below freezing weather conditions. In the finding of facts, the subject petition pertains to the 6,195 square foot building, one story service center located along near state thruway, which is known as the Indian Castle Service Center, Interstate 90, near state service area MP210, town of Dan Danube, County of Herkimer, New York State. Building that is subject to the subject of this petition is properly classified under 19 NYCRR Part 1221, Building Code of New York State. 303.3 Assembly Group A2 Occupancy. Group A2 Occupancy includes assembly uses intended for food and or drink consumption, including but not limited to restaurants, cafeteria, and similar dining facilities. The building constructed type has been correctly, construction type has been correctly classified as constructed type 2B non-combustible construction, fully sprinklered under 19 NYCRR Part 1220, Building Code of New York, Section 602.2. The petitioner states that they utilized a smoke test as set out in the attached document, the included documents in lieu of the water test as, as prescribed by the code. This testing approach was taken due to weather and temperature at the sites at the time of testing. The petitioner states in summary, Exhibit 1, that due to the environmental conditions, freezing temperatures, that they, A.E. Com Tishman Builder, submitted an RFI exhibit, which was included as in Exhibit 2, to the designer AECOM USA Incorporated requesting a smoke test at the time of inclement weather conditions, December 16th, 2021. Reply was given, the reply given was permitted only when freezing conditions exist. The first test for cast iron grease waste pipe using smoke tests was performed January 25th, 2022 by plumbing contractor Danforth, witnessed by AECOM USA Incorporated Richard Hansen. Petitioner stated in the summary that a second test pertaining to the PVC sanitary waste pipe was performed by Dan Forth on February 16, 2022, utilizing smoke tests witnessed by Richard Hansen, AECOM USA. Both tests observed were determined to have passed, which is included in Exhibit 3. The petitioner provided as part of Exhibit 3 the daily logs noting that on January 25th, the overnight temperature was minus 17, the day temperature of 
was of 13 degrees Fahrenheit. No log information was provided for February 26 testing. The email of the RFI, which included, which was included in Exhibit 2, did not include the New York State Thruway Authority code official. Information was not provided to the state otherwise. The petitioner seeks that they utilize the smoke test to set out in the attachment patch documentation in lieu of the water test as prescribed by the code. This testing approach was taken due to weather and temperature at the sites at time of testing. The petitioner stated in the summary exhibit one, at this time, a competition, the design builder is completing the final punch for this requirements for Indian Castle Service Center temporary certificate of occupancy. It was in the final walkthroughs and assembling final documentation for certificate of occupancy when the need for this variance was realized. As a finding fact, the smoke test is not equivalent substitute for either the air test or water test. In testimony, the applicant stated that the building is occupied currently by the public and the staff full time um, by staff and would be a hardship to the occupancy and owners because the facility would need to be closed for a couple of weeks to complete the water test and reopen the facility. So, the code, local code enforcement official has been consulted this matter and has provided no response with regards to granting of this variance under Part 1205. In view of the above findings, the board grants the variance for the petitioner and the board finds that granting this variance will not substantially adverse, adversely affect the uniform code's provisions for health, safety, and security. Strict compliance with the code would entail um, practical difficulties and a, and, a, and a hardship that would otherwise be unwanted because such would be necessary in light of alternatives which, without a loss of level of safety, achieve the intended objective of the code. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a variance under 19 NYCRR Part 1222, Section 302.2 B and is hereby proposed to be granted. This decision is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval for any general plan specifications presented in support of this application. And I so move. Do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Garlock seconds. I'll pull the board. Mr. Badali? Shaheen Badali, aye. Mr. Ellis? Andy Ellis, aye. Ms. Swistak? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Garlock? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye. Five ayes and no nays, the petition is granted. Now reading the next petition. The chair makes the following motion, petition number 2022-0474. Um, petitioner is Robert McCarty of AECOM Tishman. The petition pertains to a variance for a plumbing test that is known as the New York State Thruway Authority Chittenango Service Center. Total floor area is 6,195 square feet, construction type 2B, one story height located on Interstate 90 near state service area MP 266, Town of Sullivan, Town of Madison, New York State. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCR Part 1222, the Plumbing Code, Section 312.2, which states that a water test shall be applied to the drainage system either in its entirety or in sections. And if applied to it, the entire system shall have shall not shall have been substituted to test of it of a less of, excuse me test of less than 10 feet of head of water the pressure test shall be held for not less than 15 minutes the system shall then be tight at all points petitioner seeking relief for a, for a variance 
to allow a pressurized smoke test in lieu of the required water test due to below freezing weather conditions. In the findings of facts, one subject petition pertains to a 6,190 square, 95 square foot building, one story service center located along near state through a, which is known as the Chittenangle Service Center, Interstate 90s, New York State Service Area, MP266, Town of Sullivan, County of Madison, New York State. The building that is subject to this position, does it, but, excuse me, the subject of this petition is properly classified under 19 NYCRR Part 1221, Building Code of New York State, 303.3 Assembly Group A. Group A occupancy includes assembly uses intended for food and or drink consumption, including, but not limited to, restaurants, cafeterias, and similar dining facilities. The building construction type has been properly classified as construction type 2B, non-combustible construction, fully sprinkled under 19 NYCR Part 1221, Building Code of New York State, Section 602.2. The petitioner states that they utilized a smoke test as set out in the attached documents in lieu of the water test as, as prescribed by the code. This testing approach was taken due to weather and temperature at the site at the sites at time of testing. Petitioner states that the summary exhibit one that due to due to the environmental conditions, freezing temperatures, they, a competition and builder, submitted an RFI exhibit two to the designer, AECOM USA Incorporated, requesting a smoke test at the time of inclement weather conditions, December 16, 2021. Reply was given, excuse me, the reply given was permitted only when freezing conditions exist. The first test for cast iron increased waste trap pipes using smoke tests was performed January 31st, 2022 by plumbing contractor Danforth, witnessed by AECOM USA Incorporated, Richard Hansen. Six, the petitioner states the second test of the grease waste system was performed February 9th using a smoke test and was noted in, in, as passing. Seven, the petitioner stated in the summary that the final test pertaining to the PVC sanitary waste pipe was performed by Danforth on February 10th, 2022, utilizing smoke tests witnessed by Richard Hansen, AECOM USA. Both tests observed were determined to have passed. Exhibit three. Eight, petition. Provided as part of Exhibit 3, the daily logs noting that on January 31st, the overnight temperature was 6 degrees Fahrenheit and the day temperature was 25 degrees Fahrenheit. No log information was provided for February 21st, 21st testing. Nine, email of the RFI, including Exhibit 2, did not include the New York State Thruway Authority code official. Information is not provided to the state otherwise. 10, the petition states that they utilized the smoke test to set out the attached documentation in lieu of the water test as prescribed by the code. The testing approach was taken due to the weather and temperatures at the site at time of testing. 11, petitioner stated that it stated in the summary, Exhibit 1, at this time, a competition, the design builder, is completing the final punch list requirements for Indian Castle Service Center temporary certificate of occupancy. It was in final walkthroughs and assembly final documentation for certificate of occupancy when the need for variance was realized. 12, the smoke test is not an equivalent substitute for either the air test or the water test. 13, in testimony, the applicant stated that the building is occupied by the public and is staffed full time, and it would be a hardship to the occupants and the owners because the facility would need to be closed for weeks to complete the water test and reopen the facility. 14, Code official, code, excuse me, the local code official has been consulted in this matter and provided no response with regards to granting the variance under Part 1205. In view of the above finding, the board grants the variance for the petitioner and the board finds that granting this variance will not substantially adversely affect the uniform code for decisions for health, safety, and security. Strict compliance with the code would entail practical difficulties, unnecessary hardship, and would otherwise be unwanted because such would be unnecessary in light of alternatives, which, without a loss of level of safety, achieve the intended objectives of the code. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for variance from 19 NYCRR 1222, section 
312.2 BN is hereby proposed to be granted. And that this decision is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval for any general plan specifications presented for this application. And I so move. I second. Swiss deck seconds. Pull the board. Mr. Badali. Shane Badali, aye. Mr. Ellis. Andy Ellis, aye. Mr. Garlock. Ms. Swistak? Aye. And Chair votes aye. Five ayes, no nays. Petition is granted. In regards to petition number 2022-0475, the chair makes the following motion. With regard to this petition, the uh, applicant is Robert Accardi of ADCOM Tishman. Petition pertains to a variance for the plumbing testing that were what is known as near state through the authority Junius Pond Service Center, total floor area of 6,195 square feet, construction type 2B, one story in height, located it on Interstate 90, New York State Service Area, ME342, Town of Junius, County of Seneca, New York State. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCR Part 1222, the plumbing code section 312.2 which states that a water test shall be applied to the drainage system either in its entirety or in sections and shall be submitted to a test of not less than 10 feet of head of water for a Cheshire test shall be held for not less than 15 minutes the system shall then be tight at all points petitioners seeking relief from a variance to allow the pressurized smoke test in lieu of the water required water test due to the below freezing conditions in the findings of facts, one, the subject petition pertains to 6,195 square foot building, one story service center located on the New York State Thruway, which is known as the Junius Pond Service Center, Interstate 90, New York State Service Area, MP342, Town of Junius, County of Seneca, New York State. Two, the building that is subject to this excuse me, subject of this petition is properly classified under 19 NYCR Part 1221, Building Code of New York State 303.3 Assembly Group A. Group A occupancy includes assembly uses intended for food and or drink consumption, including but not limited to restaurants, cafeterias, and similar dining facilities. Three, the building construction type has been, crop, been correctly classified as constructed type 2B non-combustible construction, fully sprinklered under 19 MYCR Part 1220, Building Code of New York State, Section 602. Four, the petitioner states that they utilized a smoke test to set out in the attached documentation in lieu of the water test as prescribed by code. This testing approach was taken due to the weather and temperature at the site at the sites at time of testing. Five, the petitioner states in the summary, Exhibit 1, that due to the environmental conditions, freezing temperatures, they, a competition builder, submitted an RFI, which is including Exhibit 2, to the designer, AECOM USA Incorporated, requesting a smoke test at the time of inclement weather conditions, uh, December 6 to, excuse me, December 16th, 2021. Reply was given, excuse me, reply given was permitted only when freezing conditions exist. The first test for cast iron grease waste pipes using a smoke test was performed January 24, 2022 by plumbing contractor Danforth, witnessed by AECOM USA Incorporated Richard Hansen, and was deemed as a passing test. Six, the petitioner stated in the summary that a final test pertaining to the PVC sanitary waste pipe was performed by Danforth on January 31, 2022 utilizing a smoke test witnessed by Richard Hansen and AECOM USA. Both tests observed were determined to have passed. See Exhibit 3. 7. Petitioner provided as part of Exhibit 3 the daily logs noting that on January 21st, the overnight temperature was 4 degrees and the day temperature was 15 degrees. No log information was provided for January 24th testing. Excuse me, 23rd, 20 excuse me, January 31st testing. 
The email of the RFI exhibit did not include the New York State code official information, excuse me. The email of this is number eight, the email of the RFI exhibit two did not include the New York State through authority code official information is not provided to the state otherwise. Nine, petitioner states that they utilized a smoke test to set out in the attached documentation in lieu of the wastewater as prescribed by the code, excuse me, in lieu of the water test as prescribed by the code. This testing approach was taken due to weather and temperature at the site of testing. 10, the petitioner stated in the summary, including exhibit one, at this time, a competition, the design builder is completing the final punch list requirements for the Junius Pond Service Center uh, temporary certificate of obviously. It was in the final walkthroughs and someone found documentation for certificate of when the need for variance was realized. 11, the smoke test is not an equivalent substitute for either the air test or the water test. In testimony, the applicant stated that the building is occupied by full-time staff and soon be open to the public. However, it would be a hardship to the occupants and owners because the facility would be needed to be closed for weeks to complete the water test and reopen the facility. 13, the local code official has been consulted in this matter and provided no response with regards to the granting of the variance under part 1205. In view of the above findings, the board grants variance for the petitioner and the board finds that granting of this variance will not substantially adversely affect the uniform codes provisions for health, safety, and security. Strict compliance with the code would entail uh, practical difficulties um, and unnecessary hardship and would otherwise be unwarranted because such would be unnecessary in light of alternatives, which without a loss of level of safety achieve the intended objectives of the code. With Wherefore, it is determined that the application for variance from 19 NYCR part 1221 section 312.2 be and is hereby proposed to be granted. And that this decision is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plan specifications presented in support of this application and I so move. Do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Garlock seconds. Pull the board. Mr. Badali. Shane Badali, aye. Mr. Ellis. Andy Ellis, aye. Ms. Swistak. Aye. Mr. Garlock. Aye. The chair votes aye. Five ayes, no, not, no nays. And the petition is granted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we jump into our next uh, hearing, I would like to uh, take a recess for the board members. Okay. Okay. And then we'll be back in about five minutes. Annette, you can hear me okay, right? Perfect. Thank you, Dora. Uh, we are out of recess. We're back in session. We're now going to hear our seventh, seventh case today. This is uh, the matter of petition 2022-0482. The petitioner is CBJ Entertainment. And uh, we have the applicants here. Why don't you come up? Um, we'll have to get the camera pointed towards your direction. Okay, so state your name and your address. Good morning, Sean C. Jr. Last name spelled S H A U G H N E S S Y. Okay. 2019 Mahalan Road, Cleveland, New York. 13042. Okay. So, tell us about. All right. Uh, I'm going to be a nervous wreck. First thing I'm going to. Uh, Stakes, thanks for your guys for your time. You can sit down and talk and feel more calm here. Thank Please. you for you guys' time and, and hearing my case. Um, I received a 
stop work order from the codes officer, town of Miami, Ray Walker, um, just within days of me opening my attraction, my amusement device. And I sent the paper to you guys on the work order, see so the system. Um, thank you. If I could, I kind of want to give you guys a timeline. Can I step up and hand you guys a piece of paper? Uh, if you hand it to us, you have to leave it with us. I'll leave it with you. I, I have it. This is a copy. This is something we already have. It's kind of an exhibit that I wanted to add to it. Is it something we already have? No. Um, are we okay to do that? Yep. Oh, yeah. I made copies as much as I possibly could. Okay. Give us kind of basically a timeline of this amusement device and how long it's been. Uh, in Oneida County. Okay, one second now, just before you, um, we're going to enter this as Exhibit A. A. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So on on the timeline from 2009 to 2013, the the amusement device has been owned by a Ronald Mexico. Well, yes. From Ronald Mexico from 2014 to present, I've owned the attraction, the amusement device that uh, we're here to talk about it now. Um, January 2019, I purchased 25 acres uh, at 1861 State Route 49, Town of Vienna, oper to operate my amusement device. March 25th, 2019, Ray Walker was appointed zoning officer by the town of Vianna Town Board. May 16, 2019, I <clears throat> presented a plan and application for Prevail Stream CMY, which is currently CBJ Entertainment. At the town of Town of Vianna Planning Board meeting, Ray Walker was not present. Jan June 20th, 2019. Vianna Planning Board conducted a public hearing at their monthly meeting and approved my special use permit. Ray Walker was not present. October 2019, Field Screens opened operations successful for the Halloween season. August 9th, 19, 2020, Ray Walker arrives at my attraction unannounced, informing me that I need I that I needed. Building permits, concrete slabs, tie down points, architectural plans. I refute these claims and also inf informs him I will be doing a haunted walk trail due to the COVID restrictions. July 29, 2021, received a letter from Ray Walker once again demanding a building permit. At that point, I, I hired an attorney, Mr. Herbert Culley. August 23rd, 2021, my attorney Cully writes a letter to Ray Walker re refuting his claims and states the attraction is governed by the Department of Labor's Healthy and our Safety and Health. <laughs> September 7th, 2021, uh, Town of Miami attorney Evan Rossi responds with a letter reaffirming Ray Walker's position. September 14, 2021, I submitted to the Vienna Zoning Board of Appeals for a ZBA interpretation. October 7, 2021, Ray Walker hand delivers me a, a stop work and deceased letter at the amusement device attraction on opening night. October 9th, I received letters from via the CBA stating no documents have been submitted supporting an action or decision taken by the by the code slash zoning officer. October 12, 2021, the United County Supreme Court judge conducted a site visit of my amusement device attraction. Attorneys Cully, Rossi, Ray Walker, and I'm sure I'm leaving out a few other um, that Vianna Town Board member Mike Davis, and I was also present. October 15th through the 17th, judge grants me approval 
with the fire truck on site also remits cakes back to the ZBA. October 22nd, Vianna ZBA holds a meeting to determine if application is valid and scheduled for a public hearing. October 10th, Vianna ZBA conducts a public hearing and dismisses the application as being outside their jurisdiction. That's kind of the timeline of what um, I kind of went through with this and also the operation. Yeah, for the uh, amusement device. Um, okay, just one thing. If you're going to speak, you need to state your name and come up and speak in front. Otherwise, okay. okay. You're welcome to sit up front and state your name. And okay. Name. I will do that. Okay, if you're going to. Yeah, go ahead and state your name so that if you speak, your court reporter knows who's speaking. My name is Tatiana Salazar, and my address? Yep. I live on uh, Second Street, Camden, New York. Okay. Could you spell your name, please? My first name is T A T Y A N A, and my last name is S A L A Z A R. Um, I sent you pictures. I'm pretty sure that I sent you the picture of the fire truck that was out there that the judge granted me the uh, okay as long as I had a fire truck there. I think that, that, that came with a pamphlet for it. Um, and also the fire chief in North Bay um, conducted his own law inspection and walked through and, and looked at it. Okay. Uh, if I can enter more stuff as in exhibits. I got a lot for you. I'm sorry. Are these included in our packet? Uh, no, I don't believe so. You only brought three? Uh, I, 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 I just like. <laughs> well, you'll have a few so you can kind of get a kind of a lay of the land. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
And then all the little ziggy zag lines there where the oranges are the pass through. So if we got to move people through faster, we open up the passageways to get them out. Uh, so it kind of gives you a detail of what, and again, all the yellows are all the exits on the, on the uh, amusement device. Can you see where each of the trailers is abutted together? Still now, and X is in the jack, holding them up currently. I'm sorry. Um, you'll need to speak up just a little bit because I couldn't hear her. Okay. You could see. Why don't you come down up to the side? So let, let me just interrupt. So I can, because we, we've got a lot of information here. So let me understand. Um, so where it says open space, is that a, what is that rectangle box? What does that represent inside of tractor trailer truck unit? Is it a building? Is it open? What is this? We're referring to. I'm looking at the top of your drawing of exhibit BB where it says ticket booth. Then it says open space. What is what is that? So how the system works is that um, we only allow a certain amount of. No, people. no, no. I want to know what the structure is. Is that a fence? That's all, it's all. These are all consist of tractor trailers. These are all the tractor trailers. Okay. And, and these things all screwed together? No, just abutted. And do you do they are they stay there permanently abutted like this, or do you take it apart and put it together? I can, or I can take it apart at any time. It doesn't take long. Um, when I purchased the property, I set them on the property. Um, if somebody wanted to call me up and say the state fair, for example, yeah. if I wanted to go to state fair with it, um, I can go in there with track trailer, a uh, tractor, and in a matter of hours have that deassembled and ready to go. What about is are the tractor trailer trucks are they all butted together, or do you have some split? Spaces or things that splice them. There's an inside the uh, track of trailers itself. I got kind of a thing that is in it that shows how the trailer is set up. Okay. That's something that's in the packet. Some of this is part of the Three. Okay. Are these pictures you're gonna to have to leave those here because we're using them. I'll be there. I gotta match the tree here. to give us all the pictures so we can enter them into the record if you're going to talk about them. Okay. Just give me the same. If you look inside the pictures there, one of those new pictures. Yeah, and sorry for all this. It's something to fix. Twenty seven pictures here. 
They're going to be labeled uh, C1 through C27 exhibits. Actually, I'll let Tom do these. Label this one. Sure. You should, if those are the pictures, you can show us. Just you put those up. All right, so. Yeah, I'm sorry, I got to go step through step. If you look at the way the light comes through each one of those pictures, these are where it shows the trailers are abutted together. Now, due to the angle and all that, we really can't judge what from looking at this, but those are about four to six inches gap in between it. So what we do when we go, as you see, every trailer, every single trailer is that way. I've even went where you can actually see the ground where it's abutted together right there. And if you look down in here, you can see the ground. It's all grass, well, old grass. Um, and here, same here, you can see all the way to the ground. And I have every one of these pictures or every one of the trailers. Now I showed what the device looks like after it's set up. And what I do is you see the uh, piece of wood right here. There's a piece of wood I slide between the gap. And you see here, so it closes the gap so the breeze doesn't come through and the elements make a slippery hazard thing. So I take the board, put it against that just to seal that kind of up. So the breeze, same as this one here, it goes against it. So the, the elements from outside don't make a slippery hazard hazardous thing in between the trailers. So let me go back to my question. So all of this stuff on your exhibit, you can be this drawing here, and you also a similar drawing in the, in the exhibit one, except for the, 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 the legend at the top. All these are tractor trailer truck units that are together. Right? It's a lot of together, correct. What about this one, which is too wide? Is that they are they they're just the, the same as the rest they're abutted together so what i did is we got them close as we possibly could cut a hole through it so it's just sitting there there's no connection nothing like that all i do is grab and go okay. so they're all every every one of those trailers are just abutted together all right and let's see so they're all tractor trailers. Uh, were they ever registered to you as far as driving them over the road they were never registered to me do you have a certificate of origin or title on the trailers? No, I don't. Any DOT number, manufacturer number, anything? It has, I have all those on the side of the trailers. Each trailer's got its own. It's got its own entity for DOT. It's also, they have been inspected with 2015. You have a, what, did you give us a look at some of those pictures? <laughs> so these draw so these okay. So these little stick these are New York State inspection stickers, is that what you're yes. Doing? Everyone had a New York State inspection sticker. When I purchased them, they were currently going across the road. I purchased them for the device. Still have tires on them. Yeah, they're still they're still landing gear, everything. Like I said, within two hours I could be on a hook and gone and move somewhere if I wanted. In the winter time, what do you do? Do you leave them all? I just sleep in there on a property. All sealed up, just like you just like that. Yeah. Okay. So originally, he intended to use the land because it was becoming an issue with the town when he got his trailer stored at his house, and his neighbors were complaining that they didn't like to see that right there. Okay. I'm sorry, I think I heard all the questions here. So let me pull the board on the scene. Mr. Ellis, do you have any comments or questions? What you see in the application? Yes, was this set up prior by you at another location? Yes, um, it was set up down at the, the um, firehouse. North Bay Fireman's Field. Well, actually, the, the attraction, the device has been uh, through Oneida County a lot. Uh, prior to me owning it, Ronald Mexico uh, had it in uh, New Hartford. He had it at Utica Odd. And he also let uh, Utica College use it for a fundraiser, which was all inspected uh, by New York State Department of Labor uh, every season since 2019 to current. But you've had it set up 
somewhere else besides the property it's on right now? Yes, correct. I had it set up. I, I set it up for multiple years now at the North Bay Fireman's Field, and we had a deal cut out that I'd give them a percentage of my earnings to so they can uh, raise money. Is it your intention to ever move it again? Uh, I would definitely move it again if I found that it would be cost efficient to do it. Yes, if uh, New York State Fair uh, or Boonville Fair or Tabor Field Days uh, approached me and wanted me to move it to there, I absolutely would. You could also take one trailer and move it down to Southern Beach if they require us to do that for Pirates Weekend, which we do participate in. I have no further questions. Okay, Mr. Badali, do you have any questions? Thank you. Um, what is the maximum occupant load at one time or number of people who are visiting the structure at one time? At one time, um, we only allow a group of five in. Great. Um, That's a fantastic have... answer. I, I was hoping for a number under 10. I, I just have a, sec a secondary follow up question on that. Um, from what I see in the code, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand whether or not this structure would be labeled a temporary structure. And I mean, so, so I'm just going to read this out and, and I think that it should be somewhat addressed. It says temporary structures that cover an area greater than 120 square feet. Including connecting areas or spaces with a common means of egress or entrance that are used or intended to be used for the gathering together of 10 or more people shall not be erected, operated, or maintained for any purpose without a permit from the official. Um, so I, I do believe you're above the 120 square foot threshold, but it does not appear that you have gatherings of greater than 10 people. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, outside or inside the amusement device? No, 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 inside the structure itself. Uh, if you include the actors, I'm greater than 10, yes. Gotcha. Okay. We do not allow a uh, conveyor belt, say, um, of continuous people. What we do is we only allow a certain amount of uh, people, uh, customers, per se, inside so we can keep track of them. And keep the minimal under 50 people. Okay. And okay. And, and but all of those trailers are all entered through one common entrance. Is that correct? Yes, they come in one common entrance and they exit a common exit. Okay. Yeah. But in case of emergency, they have five exits to uh, get out of the amusement device. Okay. Well, okay, I do understand. All right, thank you. That was that was my question. Thank you. I'd like to respond to they would like to present and say the uh, exhibits to. <laughs> you call this a an amusement device? That's what you're referring it to. To um, is that a definition, a legal definition found within something? Uh, yes, the inter uh, industrial code forty five mm -hmm. for amusement devices and stuff like that. That's what I'm referring to. That's what I've been told to follow since I even before when I helped Ron Mexico out. Uh, he was underneath the industrial code forty five as well. Um, stating in there about amusement devices and stuff like that. That's inspected by a uh, New York State inspector, Paul Fauci. Paul Fauci at this time, right now, he was then the inspector of it. Um, and for the years that I've had, yeah. So I've been read. I, I, I've been following right, the Industrial Code 45. I think R12 or something. Something. I, you know, call me on that, but it's in there for that. So, Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bally, Mr. Ellis, Mr. Ellis, can I ask you if you had any questions? Yes, I asked a couple questions already. Mr. Bally, do you have any more questions? 
No, at this time I do not. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Garlock, any questions? Um, Mr. Swissbeck, do you have any questions? This law that you're quoting, does it say that you don't have to get permits? Um, that brings to one of my other uh, exhibits I want to enter. Now, every year, you got to keep it. Uh, we have yeah, to keep it. Now that's the car. I sent with that, uh, I sent a permit that actually shows how New York State Department of Labor authorizes me to, to run this. And it also has a current, this is one from before, it has a current, you can have this. You can enter that into the test. That's the permit. Yeah. Okay, got that. So that's the permit that they authorized right at the top, it says from the Department of Labor, Division of Health and Safety, and he marks the permit two, which allows me to run my amusement device, operate an amusement device. This has been going on since 2019 to current. So yes, it's overseen by New York State Department of Labor and Health. Um, he specializes in this. this uh, so I, from what I understand, he, he goes through the codes uh, portion plus the amusement device portion. So he specializes in what this is. So he follows all the laws of New York State through that industrial code to make sure that I'm in compliance with the code for amusement devices. And do they inspect your fabric? Every year. They will not issue a permit without going through and checking fabric, make sure I spray it. All the laws that New York has uh, for that. Right. And uh, the, the, I think, let me interrupt. I think the question comes back to is, you, even if this is a building at amusement event inside, it's still come under labor. Just right. because it's it's not a one or the other, it can be both. Right. So you could, it, and I think that where I'm, what I've read in this application, I think that it, and we'll speak to the code official, is the is do we define this as a building or not? And in, in the definition, which we don't have any authority to 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 vary a definition, any structure utilized or intended for supporting or sheltering any occupancy. And I think that's the, the gap here is whether this is a building or not. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fine line between whether you're, whether, you know, merry-go-round wouldn't be necessarily have your amusement or hard to find in the car or the dive bomber, which is got a capsule that goes on the end of a boom and spins up and down. You know, all of these are, are devices and they, and they provide some type of uh, shelter. But what I think Mr. Ellis or Mr. Vidali was getting to was trying to decide, you know, is this an occupancy that you're hosting? And I, I think there is an occupancy because you're, you know, allowing people to be in there and, whether it's a business or an assembly. So I think that's the question, whether this is an amusement you know, a, a structure for amusement, even though it's got wheel tires. Uh, my question comes back to is, when does it come something that you roll down the road or that you're actually using vehicles of, to, as structures? There's a lot of tractor trailer truck units that get converted to structures on private property. I think every municipality has that. And there's at some point in time, they say that's not a tractor trailer truck unit. It may have been at one time, but it's now a structure because that's what it's being used for because people parse them in. And, and, and that's the, I think that's what we're trying to sort out here. What, whether you have a structure, whether you have a building or not. And another thing is this only operates in October, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights for um, between one to five hours, depending on how many customers come. So it doesn't even operate fully. Yeah, that year. may become more, I think. So it's like 0 0.003 of the year. It's, it's it's but it could be a temporary structure type of thing, temporary. Uh, there's no heat in it. There's no have to have paramedics. There's no water. It doesn't have to it'd be a tent of a certain size. It becomes a temporary structure under the codes. See, the way I look at it is that with New York State Fair, they bring these trailers in, dump them out, fold them up, get them open, run them, put a substantial amount of people through it, 
and then fold them back up and leave it. Kind of, it's the same kind of same theory. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. A, sta a, a mobile stage comes in on a trailer on wheels and you set it up. At some point, once it gets all its legs down and picked up and everything else, it becomes now a temporary stage and it's subject to the building code. Even though it came in on wheels, so they got to take the wheels off, correct? Well, they don't. Once you come off, once you put it up on the ground and you set the jacks down, it's, it's used for a stage. It now becomes part of the building code. Oh, I'm old. I'm old. And they took the axle to the bank, wouldn't pay them until they did. Well, that's a mobile home. I'm talking about a stage as in a performance stage. Oh, okay. You know, when you got a big concert in your farm yard, you can rent stages that come in on trailers. So, anyways. Um, before I get too far into this, uh, code enforcement official or representative of the municipality. Is... Uh, yep. Okay, who, who are? Well, my name is Richard Mansfield, okay. and I'm from the town of Vienna, uh, 765 State Road 49. Okay. And um, I have a question on the term occupancy. Mm -hmm. um, and just for transparency, um, I'm an ex ZBA uh, member. Right, Tavia, just for transparency here. And my question is, sir, if <clears throat> you're defining occupancy, but I visited uh, Mr. Shaughnessy's uh, amusement device, and people that go through that are moving constantly through the device, and they're not standing around, they're moving down the aisle and then out the door at the end. So they're constantly moving. So I, I just want to get a definition on what's the term occupancy was so relative. Under the code, occupiable space is a room or enclosed space designed for human occupancy in which individuals congregate for amusement, educational, or similar purposes for which occupants are engaged in labor or which is equipped with the means of egress and light and ventilation facilities to meet requirements of this code. So that's kind of an occupiable space. A tent would be an occupiable space. Okay. So, you know, there are, so it's kind of broad in covers, but it's like tents. Like yeah, even, even if the, the people are moving through through the building, they're yes. not standing at right. any one time. They're just continually moving. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Code enforcement official, is that you? Yes. Uh, maybe I think we can have one weeks. Maybe I have a slide. Yeah. Salazar, if you could just sit aside for a moment, I think just so we, we just want to get into the camera. Just state your name and your address. My name is Ray Walker, a code enforcement officer in town of Vienna. My address 5011 Hill Road, the back of the yard, 13421. Okay. Um, basically, my contention obviously is track trailer units constitute a structure. And more specifically, a special needs structure, which is defined in the code. Uh, special music building. Any temporary or permanent building proportion thereof is occupied for. for right, this is in the code. What's that? What's that? Uh, well, I, I grabbed the wrong one. But anyways, temporary music building in the code is defined as. Permanent or special amusement building, defined in code, permanent, temporary, or mobile. It specifically says for mobile. And then it goes into defining the exact configuration that Mr. Shaughnessy has in his, in his trails. I understand, yes, at one time they were over the road functioning freight hauling trailers. They've been converted now. Now they've, they've converted to Units that are being used, as you said, for occupancy, they're being occupied. Um, Section 411 of the building code specifically deals with special needs buildings. And Chapter 1 of the building code, anything that is in the code requires a building permit. Okay. Uh, I also agree with this, the temporary, that they're, they're both the temporary structures. They have moved in the two and a half years that I've been code enforcement officer. Now, to me, that's permanent structures. They should be on a foundation, not just sitting there, or they need to be disassembled because it can only be in place 180 days. Um, so, if he was to, if he was to take these apart and just park them side by side by side and then put them together every season, 
or did you look at it any differently? Well, it's still, you still, it's not like the special museum building when he, when he assembles it. It makes any lot of people in. They could do it as temporary. Though. Well, yeah, but it would be treated. Yeah, it would be treated as temporary. Right, it wouldn't have to be on a structure. It would be treated as a temporary, just like a, a tent. You know, they were putting a tent structure up. Okay. You would acquire a building from that. It can be there for up to 180 days a year, Good. and that's and that's that's fine. That's yeah, absolutely. Okay. Be, well, it would still require the building permit, obviously, for because it's a special use to for, make sure all the life safety features are in place. Um, I also. Smith that is piece of evidence. Um, this is a document that I got online. Okay. And it, this will be exhibit D D. This talks about the uh Fun House that was assembled at Great Flags in New Jersey in 1979. It's supposed to be a temporary amusement. It was again identical, not identical, but very similar to this. It was an assembly to um, Truck trailers in a haunted house, along with the plywood and whatever. And it was supposed to be temporary. Five years later, in 1984, that structure caught fire, 18 agents were killed. Subsequently, NFPA, through NFPA 101, defining haunted houses, especially amusement buildings, and it was incorporated into NFPA 101, and then down the road, it became part of the international code and now the, right. the New York code. Yeah. And that is my contention. It's a special news of building as such and requires disability. Go ahead. All right. So, yes, um, he is right about the 1984 fire. I have something for exhibit. Uh, I got a copy here. It's the comparisons between the Haunted Castle and Field of Streams. And inside this uh, packet that I'll give you it gives the investigation report of the uh, it's right on that make that title gives the the actual what the cause was the setup of it which by far my amusement device does not even compare yep the whole packet is it does not mean. even compare to the Haunted Castle they configured of uh, and I can go through the list of this whole thing between mine and theirs, but uh, for to compare 1984 to feel the screams uh, amusement device at this time and age from 1984 to 2022, uh, I, it's, it's com not even comparisons. We're talking a configuration of uh, 17 trailers that were abutted next as formed as a square building on two of them. That's the one big thing. Uh, mine is only five trailers that the people go through. Um, the construction for aluminum trailers, the two by four configurations side by side. Uh, okay, one moment. I just need to do a couple things. I want to enter into exhibit. Exhibit DD is a uh, an article. A two eighty seven. Um, code regarding a haunted house. So, consisting of consists of eight sheets printed on both sides. Um, exhibit G, G, excuse me, G, I don't know all about so. This one. Oh, there it is. Same. Exhibit EE -E is a NFPA investigation report on um, fire and haunted castle kills eight. It consists of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, pages. Uh, some of them printed on both sides with Includes drawings of haunted houses, floor plans, etc. Exhibit FF is a fun house patrol call substitute for alarms. It's a New York Times article copy consisting of two pages, uh, or two sheets of paper printed on both sides. Exhibit GG is a 
one sheet of paper comparing Six Flags, New Jersey, Haunted Castle, 1984, to Field of Screens, Haunted Attraction, 2022. So those are for the record. Do I have that one? And then, uh, we'll open second here. This is a joke. This is um, Exhibit H. H is a, an article. Copy of an article, Fire Engineering 1, 2. Reading 4. Five sheets of paper regarding um, fire at 1984 at Six Flags Great Adventure Museum Park in Jackson Township. Um, that is uh, Exhibit HH. Okay, that almost is. Sorry about that. Go ahead. So now again, the Haunted Castle 1984, the, the, the fire that was caused there was due to a, a young gentleman with a lighter walking through the lighter trying to see his way through the attraction that they had there, which caught high for polyurethane fabric on fire that we adapted the code from this fire from New Jersey to the code for New York. We adapted that so we wouldn't have run into the same problem again. They had inaccurate, in, inaccurate, uh, everything about this thing. Okay. It's complete. Mr. Shasi, I, I want to go back to the code force official. I want to make sure he gets a chance to speak. Okay. Yeah. He started and then you interrupted him. So let him start. That's okay. Let's let him finish. Um, yeah. Like I said, my basic contention is the, the New York State code defines the special museum building as permanent, temporary, or mobile. And then it goes on to what you said. It takes you through a pathway with, that's obscured by light, silent, and everything else. I mean, the definition of 100% of what is here. I understand it's mobile. Yeah. They're, they're trailers. Yes. Yeah. They're not licensed. They haven't moved in over three years. And they're, and to me, just under the basic definition of special use of building. These fall 100% under that definition, and as such, should be treated, should be, uh, should be part of building benefit. They fall under the jurisdiction of the code. All right, Mr. Walker, I just want to see if uh, Mr. Bedali or Mr. Ellis, do you have any questions for Mr. Walker? No, thank you. So, all the trailers are currently uninspected and unregistered for the road? Yes, to my best of my knowledge. Okay. Mr. Bell, do you have any questions for Mr. Walker? Has there been any correspondence from either of you with the Department of Labor regarding the applicability of the building code in instances like this? Not really. I mean, we I did get a letter that says that, he, that they enforce that, but at the same time, that's, the health department has rules. And the health department goes in and issues permits. I go in, I issue permits in the same building. You know, it's for two different, yeah. it's two different permits for two different things. They're not. So they're, okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's. Oh, no, I just want, want to let him answer the question. Yeah. This looks like, do you have any questions for Mr. Walker? Mr. Walker, if they did get a building permit, um, and it, it's for a temporary structure. Do you keep the occupancy throughout or does he come back every year for a temporary? It would be, I would personally, I would treat it just like I do a fireworks time. They have to come every year when they set up so that I can go, go through and do inspections. Do inspections and make, make, the, make yeah, sure everything make sure that is up everything to is over prior to. For any changes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would treat it the same as any other truck, temporary truck. Have you been in this structure or to see? Only twice, both times, short time. First time is the first time that Mr. Shaughnessy and I spoke, and I, I this was a couple of years ago. And I told him I thought it might need a building permit, and he didn't agree with me. He invited me down, I walked through it kind of quick. I mean, we didn't, you know, I didn't like what I saw, but that was irrelevant. And I told him I thought I needed a building permit, but you know, this was. The year that COVID, the year of COVID 2020, 
in 2020. Uh, and I'd seen him in, it was like August, July or August. I saw him working there and I said, oh, he's probably going to want to open up. Well, that's when I started doing research and I realized that there was never a building permit issue. So you got the special use permit, it's required by zoning, but you've never gotten building permit. So like I said, that's why I reached out to him and let me walk through. And then the second time I walked through was with the judge last year when we did the walkthrough and same thing. I was, it was just a quick walkthrough. Okay. And it was serious. In your opinion, would this, I think it's seven, it looks like seven, but he stayed at four. So how many Six. exactly? There's supposed to be six seven there. All one, two, three, four, five, six. Six. And then this one's for storage. Um, is it okay for answering? Yeah, there's five that the, the public goes through. That the attraction, the, the music device, only five trailers are used. Okay. But there's six that are attached. And so six that are attached. Okay. So as far as if somebody's in there, do do you feel this meets the travel distances for common path and travel distance that I think required? I, I believe, I don't know. Like I said, because I, I haven't, I just walked through it quick the first time. I believe it does. Um, one of my major issues is the exercises. Sure. The exercises that I saw were just, it was just basically me on paper with exit written on it. Um, it was an arrow pointing that way. For the emergency, for the emergency exits. Yeah, for emergency exits. Um, and I was sprinkler like, uh, special use of building requires sprinkler system. Sprinkler. There's no sprinkler system in it. And I was There's, like, you also wondering about the emergency lighting if there really is enough. Yeah, I don't know. I know there's emergency lighting in there, but I don't know what it's like. Um, and the pool station, proper amount of pool station. Yeah. I know they're there, I don't know if they're combined. That's, Okay. I have a question. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Before we move on, Mr. Walker, anybody else have any questions for Mr. Walker? I have a question about the Excuse me. Oh, Ask the board members. Anybody have any additional questions for Mr. Walker? Okay. I have. Uh, thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. But anything you might have yes. so. um, <sighs> All right, so the stuffy state and New York State Department of Labor, once again, specialist goes through and makes sure that I'm compliant with all the stuff that he's talking about. Uh, I'm sure that because it's very thorough and I have records tracking back the stuff that he said I had to take care of before he gave me a permit. Uh, again, we adapted the law from New Jersey that New York State goes through thoroughly and picks. I mean, this guy does not let me get away with nothing. Um, all the safety issues I got on everything. Um, there's another thing I also want to submit that is. I want to submit it to OB. Uh, now I'm going to go and save the portion of everything. I want to submit this in to the director to read on what it is. Okay, so this will be you. Submit. Hi. Hi, yeah, Susan. Exhibit I. Uh, so the letter from the fire chief Joe Matthews um, to whom it may concern. Ready? Yep. All right, so the letter states from the chief of uh, North Bay. Billy Shaughnessy is a member of good standings of North Bay Fire Department, Fire and Rescue. Billy joined the department in 6 1 2003. He has held many positions, including lieutenant, training officer, captain, assistant chief, and currently holds the position of deputy chief. Billy is a very active and serves the community with pride and honor. Sincerely, Joe Matthews. Wants to make another uh, safety for it. I'm going to keep that. Um, my haunted house has 
the top line safety breaker system in there. If it detects water, fire, anything, it shuts the breaker down. So the system, the only thing running through my amusement device is electric, which is also controlled by the highest level breaker system that is made. GFI, CFI, whatever it is. But it, if you look at the top, it tells if it detects water, uh, groundage, anything. And even if it takes a load from one of the props, it takes too much of a load, shuts that breaker down and makes me chase to find out what the problem is. Back onto the report of the Pond and Castle, the comparisons to it. That operation also saw seven, approximately 7.4 7 million people from 1978. If you read the whole thing, I don't want to be redundant on it. I'm just trying to do the comparisons on what the difference between mine and Six Flags uh, 17 trailers. Um, my safety aspects, it, it uh, for, I have, Safety aspects. I have fire extinguishers in every scene, every place that New York State requires them by the exits. So I think it's approximately about 30 around there. I have for fire extinguishers that all my personnel are trained on. Uh, I'm only open less than 15 days. If I had to move the trailers, I would move them. If, if they're saying that, oh, I haven't moved them, they're mobile. I can grab onto them. If it, if it would solve the issue of me on my own property to, to take and realign my trailers every time I shut down, I would definitely do that. I mean, that's something that, for, you know, if I was required to do that, I would do that. that it's not an issue with me adjusting the moving to show that this is immune. Um, all my personnel, the Haunted Castle had an HVAC system which is a bellow system. So when the fire started through a lighter, which we don't use anymore, we're not allowed to smoke inside the buildings anymore. So the lighter lit the thing on and the smoke reached the people that died, smoke killed them, not the fire, right? That's why we have the fire system in place. So it detects smoke, we get it cleared out, which all my personnel are trained a couple of times a year for evacuation to get everybody out. There's nobody, and I have an air pack inside my inside my device for me to be the last one out to make sure everybody's out because I'm qualified to wear an air pack. So I make sure if something goes on, I'm throwing the air pack on, I'm cleaning the house out, which is not really that big. It's five trailers. I can have them cleaned out in a matter of minutes, seconds. Um, and the stuff that they use for construction, they allow tar paper in these things. They don't, New York State Department of Labor will not let me have, they take my plastic, tear plastic off my, Stuff to make sure they can go out and burn, make sure it does not burn. Because I have to have the plastic that doesn't burn, fire rated stuff, and I have to spray all the fabric with fire retardant. And they take fabric, pieces of rug, they'll take it outside, they'll burn it. These guys are very thorough at their job. And I feel that myself, that I believe that with the specialty of the state being not only a codes officer, but as well as follows it. Being a specialty of what he does in the in the in the uh, the industrial code for what my device is, I feel I'm getting the best look at it. Especially when my town doesn't even have a law for my device. Period. You know who inspects Silver Beach? The state. The same guy inspects mine. He goes down to Silver Beach and checks all their. Not not a codes guy. Everyone because he is a codes guy. Ultimately, at the end, he is a codes guy. But all all the things down there, New York State Department of Labor inspects them. Okay, I, I'm just going to interrupt you. Okay, that's because I know there's a couple other people to speak. But I'm so let me just narrow the focus of our conversation here. Right now, I think what we're trying to what the board needs to determine is does this meet the definition of of, of a building that would be. Covered under the building code, and that's what the, that's what we're getting right now. I don't. I mean, we can talk about what happened in Jersey. We can talk about all the rights and regulations. Of the code. The bottom line question right now is: Does your um, trailers that are grouped together do they constitute a, an amusement building or not? And do, are they regulated under the code? That's the bottom line. Once so we make that determination, then everything else goes from, from that point on. So. Um, and I think that's, I just 
we just got way outside of the right, right. A lot of conversations. I'm just going to narrow it down. So that's what our decision is going to come down to is whether the code applies to this building or not. So before I go on, I want to let um, you had your hand up and you had your hand up. So let yes. Let, let her speak yeah. first, and then you come, come forward, tell me your name and your address. Yes, and, and keep your points to just what we're talking about. Is the yeah. is building code or not a building code? Okay. My name is Tracy. Last name is Laughlin, L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. I'm a resident of Cleveland, New York. I own a trucking company and a lot of the trailers that are in question. I also have a New York State dealer's license, so I have a dealer place. The reason I was waving was because I think he forgot I was here. He did ask me before if he needs to move them around, if someone asked him to take his device somewhere else, if I could do that. Since I have an interstate insurance um, dealer plate, what I would do as a truck driver is go down and do a complete inspection of the trailer first, check the tires, check the axles, check to make sure everything's good and safe. I have to do that before I drive a truck, period. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would go through that whole safety inspection first, and then I would just hook. He'd have to do the unplugging, and I could take it and tow it anywhere he wants. Um, that's what makes it mobile. Um, what he's referencing is Sylvan Beach. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but that's like a permanent thing that's been there for 50, 60 years. The state goes down there and does inspections on those. Those are considered like a permanent building structures. These, he might be asked at any moment to move, and I could do that for him. Um, he didn't move them one COVID and two, he's been shut down. So he was issued a special use permit by our town. Um, he brought in the same inspectors that always did the inspections. They did the inspections. They came in, he opened, he operated, he, he was getting it, building it up and he was ready for his second year. And then all of a sudden our town never went through any of this before. And it's been up and operating for a very long time. Now, all of a sudden he's operating and they. Mr. Walker comes in and says, you've got to cease to desist. You can't do this any longer. Yes, it's the definition is structured, as you're saying. But he's also asking for things like um, fire extinguishers. These trailers are not insulated. He has no heat in there. It's not a permanent structure that's got furnaces in there or any of those things operating. It's in October. It snows in New York State. The water lines would freeze. He's went above and beyond with all of the fire extinguishers. Um, he's he's followed everything that the code enforcement person from the state told him to do with the like the breakers and such. They weren't nice to him. They, well, they weren't mean, but they said you have to comply. So that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. You she pretty much covered what I had questions about. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you, so, uh, Rick Mansfield. I just have one question, sir. Um, and I agree with what they've been saying about the Department of Labor come in on many, many years and inspected uh, these amusement devices. And there's really not, there, there's nothing in the town of Vienna zoning laws that uh, clarify or even discuss as amusement devices. And my question, sir, is who has jurisdiction on something that isn't identified in a municipality zoning law, but it's identified in the state uh, state codes. And the highly qualified trained state inspectors come in and they inspect these uh, uh, devices and say, hey, you're good to go, or you need to change this, okay, this, and, and then they comply. And then your local codes guy, uh, codes officer comes in and say, no, you're not in compliance. Well, who makes the final decision then here on issuing these permits for for these these devices to operate, and if the state gives that authority to do that, and 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 uh, personnel invest their time, energy, and monies into that and develop that, and they're legal to go for the state, who can actually override the state at this stage? That's my question, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um. So. Let me just re re rephrase what our decision is here. We're, we're trying to, we need to determine whether this um, facility of tractor trailer electronics units falls under and being used as an amusement falls under the building code of New York State. The, the, you can have two, one, two, or three different regulatory agencies oversee 
one component, one, one similar device. Amusements, um, well, they can be buildings, but they may also fall under labor law. And so just because you fall under labor law doesn't mean you're excluded from the building code. Just because you're under building code doesn't mean you're excluded from labor law. In fact, you know, the your example that you talked about, if you were to tow these trailers down the road, yes. you you were, you would not be even though they're compliant with the labor department, you'd have to comply with the Department of Transportation. Right. Just because they got towed and they comply with the Department of Transportation doesn't necessarily exclude them to being regulated by the building code. Uh, food trucks and trailers today are now regulated by the by the fire prevention and building the uniform fire prevention and building code. They are regulated by that code. The right when they're towed down the road, they're regulated by the D the New York State DOT and they're regulated by the health department. Three different agencies. Oh, okay. And so they all can have overlap. And that's what and so while you are, are being complying with the labor laws, you may also have to comply with the building code. And that's what we're here to determine whether that whether you're use and operation of this facility would do that. So it's not one or the other, it can be both. It's I'm trying to format the, the, the conversation and decision in that. So do we have a, you have one more? Yeah. What's the occupancy of the building again? I was curious. Well, that's the, that's one piece. It could be an uh, assembly occupancy, depending on the deep layer, or if it's less than 50, it could be, you know, be occupancy, and that's one of the pieces we're trying to do. Each individual trailer one has probably two to three actors in at a time. It's a matter of how much space is in this. In this. The entirety of the thing, it doesn't go individually because it's, yeah, the usage. So it could be a B, it could be an A, we'll take them. But first of all, we need to decide how to the build code applies to this first. Okay, so that's our decision process. So um, I I don't know that there's anything else that we need for our decision process. So I think we're ready to go into recess. Bring you back in about 15 minutes or something. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to recess and we can go off the record. Thank you. Um, we're coming out of recess. We're going to continue with our hearing in regards to uh, petition 2022-048 uh, CBJ Entertainment LLC. Um, before I make a motion, um, I just want to uh, reiterate what I said before. This decision is not about whether the Labor Department has oversight or over, overrules building. This really comes down to defining whether the building code applies to this building, and that was our that was what we had to determine today. Okay, there's no variances applied here because um, you didn't ask for any variances because you'd only get a variance if you, if if there was a building permit applied for and then you needed some relief on the building permit. So this is just basically a decision on whether the code officials determination is upheld or not. Okay. All right. So I'm going to make the following motion in regards to petition number 2022-0482. Uh, the petitioner is CBJ Entertainment, LLC. Petition pertains to an appeal of the code enforcement official determination related to the use of transportation trailers for special amusement, known as the Field of Screams, located at 1861 State Route 49, Town of Vienna, County of Oneida, New York State. The petition, petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1221 Building Code Section 105.2 Building Permits, which states that no person or entity shall commence, perform, or continue any work that must conform to the Uniform Code and or the Energy Code unless such person or entity has applied to the authority having just a jurisdiction for a building permit. The authority having the jurisdiction has issued a building permit authorizing such work. Such building permit was not or has not been revoked or suspended, and such building has not ex building per excuse me, such building permit is not expired. Petitioner is also seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1221, the building code section 105.5 certificate of occupancy, which states that where the stricter of the authority having jurisdictions code enforcement program or a part 1203 compliant. Code enforcement program requires a certificate of occupancy for permission to use or occupy a building or structure 
or any portion thereof, no person or entity shall use or occupy such building or structure or such portion thereof. In addition, petitioner seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1261, Property Means Code, Section 107.1.4, Unlawful Structure, which states that an unlawful structure is one found in whole or in part to be occupied by more persons than permitted under this code, or was erected, altered, or occupied contrary to law. The petitioner is seeking uh, appeal of the authority having jurisdictions determination that the six transport trailers, when positioned or arranged for use as an amusement device, is not a building or structure regulated by the New York State Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code, but by Department of Labor under 12 NYCRR Industrial Rule Code Part 45 amusement devices. The petitioner notes that the haunted house was previously been inspected and regulated by the New York State Department of, of Labor. In findings of facts, one, the subject petition pertains to six transport trailers arranged for use as a haunted house known as Field of Screams, located at 1861 State Route 49, Town of Vienna, County of Oneida, State of New York. And as described in Exhibit 1 of the petition. 2. A letter dated July 29, 2021, the Town of Vienna Code Enforcement Officer noted that the petitioner placed six trailers in configuration on the petitioner's property to assembly to assemble a haunted house, but the petitioner did not obtain any, any required building permits, no construction permit inspections were conducted, and no certificate of occupancy had been issued for the structure. Therefore, it was an illegal structure as defined by Section 107.1.4 of the Property Maintenance Code of New York State. The Town of Vienna Code Enforcement Officer requested the petitioner obtain <laughs> excuse me, obtain a required building permit and that in addition to the application and site plan, New York State Education Law requires stamp signed plans from a New York State registered architect or licensed engineer for the construction of any commercial work. Exhibit four in the petition. Number three, Town of Vienna Code Enforcement Officer issued a stop work order and cease and desist order on October 7, 2021, and stated that the petitioner failed to get a building permit as required by the Building Code of New York State, the Fire Code of New York State, and the Property Maintenance Code of New York State. No certificate of occupancy had been issued for use of the building, and as such, it, and it is an unlawful structure and its occupancy is prohibited. The petitioner, as noted as being in violation of Section 105.2, Building Permits of the Building, Fire and Property Maintenance Codes of New York State, see Exhibit 4 in the petition. Number four, the petitioner states that the Planning Board decision dated July, June 25, 2019, noted that fencing, screening, lighting, and signage must be complied with, see Exhibit 2 of the petition. Number five, the petitioner presented evidence that the haunted house has been regulated by the New York State Department of Labor under 12 NYCRR Industrial Code Part 45 amusement devices since 2004. See Exhibit 3 of the petition. Number six, the petitioner presented evidence that the petitioner obtained a permit to operate an amusement device from the Department of Labor from October 4th, 2017 to, to October 31st, 2018, and from October 2nd, 2018 to October 31st, 2019, see Exhibit 3. Number seven, the local code enforcement official has been consulted in this matter and does not support the granting of any appeal or variance under Part 1205. The Town of Vienna Code Enforcement Official states in their response dated September 8, 2022, that the basis for my decision to require a building permit for the haunted house was based on the definition of an amusement building as defined in both the fire code and the building code. See the Town of Vienna Code Enforcement Officials letter dated September 8, 2022 in the exhibits. Number eight, 
The town of Vienna Co enforcement official further states the town's response that this subject structure is regulated by the following code requirements. Special museum buildings are specifically regulated in sections 907 and 914 of the fire code and sections 411 and 907 of the building code. See the town of Vienna code enforcement officials letter dated September 8th, 2022. Nine, while, while neither the petitioner has cited, has been cited to section 11 views of buildings of 2020 building code of New York state, nor has a petitioner requested a variance from any of the requirements listed therein is noted that section 202 of the building code of New York State 2020 defines a special amusement building as any temporary or permanent building, a portion thereof that is occupied for amusement, entertainment, or educational purposes, and that contains a device or a system that conveys passengers or provides a walkway along, around, or over course in any direction so arranged that the means of egress path is not readily apparent due to visual or audio distractions. And or is intentionally unfounded or is not readily available because of the nature of the attraction or the mode of conveyance through the building or the structure. See section 411 of the 2020 building code of New York State. <laughs> In view of the above findings, the board denies the appeal for the petitioner, therefore sustains the determination of a code enforcement official. This decision is limited to specific building and application before it and is contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give any implied approval or generally general plan specifications presented in support of this action. And I so move. And do I have a second? I second. The Swiss deck second. Uh, I'll poll the board, Mr. Badali. Jane Badali, aye. Mr. Ellis. Andy Ellis, aye. Mr. Garlock, aye. Ms. Swistak, aye. The chair votes aye. The motion is, is granted to deny the appeal. Yes, we didn't support your appeal. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll end the hearing and thank you for everybody's uh, efforts today. We can go out on the record. <laughs>